All right, happy Wednesday, Thursday. It's been a long week. Yeah, let's hold on. You know what? Let's flash back. All right, restart. Happy Thursday. There, I got it right this time. Um, what's going on, guys? Uh, welcome to Fox 5 Live, the after show, the after party, I guess you could say. Uh, I'm starting things off. Molly will be here shortly. Um, let's see, yesterday, Wisdom and I did uh, picks. We had a little fun, uh, and we'll see who owes who Chick-fil-A next week. Um, Steelers, I think, start tonight against, uh, but, but we both picked the Steelers to win tonight. So, no, no tonight doesn't hold much weight in the Chick-fil-A battle for the week. Uh, anyway, today I thought we'd discuss something a little interesting because I've been sent this article. Um, it's a, a patch.com article that says um, snow on the way here for Thanksgiving, which makes me go, don't think so. Uh, I think it was it was written, uh, what's, <laughs> happy Thursday. What's up, Kathy? Um, I'll say hi to Jason, too, even though <laughs> I do too. I don't do politics, so um, I will. Uh, I thought we'd do something a little interesting with the uh, snowfall in November and kind of what it takes to get halfway decent snow here in D.C. heading into the uh, November months. Um, so I figured that we'd have some fun with that, and kind of, but, but we'll kick things off uh, with local weather. And let me start you off actually with a, a live look at um, at what's going on outside. Let's do uh, this shot of the Capitol, if I can find it. There it is. Let's, uh, let's show you the Capitol, because we do have a few clouds out there right now, uh, high and thin variety, but a, a good amount of sunshine also shining through, especially if you live west of town. I'll show you live satellite here in just a second. Um, one little uh, kind of note is that, hey, guess what? It's still hurricane season, and we do have a new area that we're tracking a little bit of, uh, right now, let me bring myself into the picture frame. Hello. Um, 
one little area that we are watching uh, right now in the tropics, and it's towards the bottom of the screen here. So let me kind of refocus and, and bring it into the picture, get rid of my uh, Chiron there. And um, it's, uh, it's this area at the bottom of your screen here that uh, has popped up in the Southern Caribbean that is it's worth a little bit of a watch. The good news is we have so many of these cold fronts coming across the United States. One's there. There's going to be another one behind it. And we got this one that just moved off the coastline. Um, it should, anything that is able to develop down here, even if it does move north, it should get pushed out. Uh, and that's if it develops at all. There's a lot of wind shear out there, which is bad for hurricane development and all that other stuff. So while it's in an OK zone for development right now, since it's not going to sit there forever, uh, it may get torn apart at the end of the day here. But just to let you know, I just because it popped up on, on my feed today, National Hurricane Center is giving it a 10% uh, chance of developing over the next five days. So they're watching it, not the highest chance. And they did have one out here that was at a 50% chance that had since died down, never got a name. I think Sean would be the next name if anything uh, does get a name. So I thought that was uh, kind of interesting there. Uh, quick look, and let's switch over back to the, the live look at the satellite feed here locally. This is the highest resolution satellite we have off of uh, the new weather satellite that's up. This is the GO-16. Uh, nice stripe of clouds, probably a little boundary in the atmosphere there, coming right uh, through central Virginia up into southern Maryland. So certainly for those in uh, St. Mary's County, uh, I just circled the wrong county when I said St. Mary's. Let's try that again. St. Mary's County there, Charles County there, Calvert County there, um, Prince George's County, uh, Anne Arundel County. Uh, they're definitely dealing with uh, some cloud cover to start the day. Down through, uh, I, I'd say even Fredericksburg is somewhere. Let's see, I-95, Fredericksburg's probably sunny, but as you get west, or I'm sorry, east of I-95, you're running into a little bit of a cloud deck. Won't last all day. Other than that, winds starting to pull straight out of the west here. You see all the clouds streaming across the mountains. And when winds come straight out of the west like that, they tend to do almost like, uh, don't pay attention to the background here. Uh, but let's say you have a mountain that looks like that. And I'll change my color and we'll go green here on the winds. So winds come up the mountain. And after they come down the other side, they start to bounce like that. Like, so the winds are kind of uh, bouncing up and down throughout the, uh, throughout the atmosphere there. And because of that, you get these features, these little roll clouds. See these waves of clouds coming across Montgomery County, across Loudoun County in Virginia. Nice little roll of clouds. And if you kind of connect the dots, you can see the rolls there, 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 there. So uh, little gravity waves coming across the mountains today, giving us occasional clouds. But uh, especially up through uh, northern, Virgi northern Virginia, the panhandle of, uh, panhandle of West Virginia there, lots of sunshine, sunny and bright. That's my best drawing of the sun I can do. There you go. Sunny and bright today. Um, and temperatures, believe it or not, up near 60 this afternoon. These are, uh, these are called meteograms, or uh, I'm sorry, these are called METARs, station METARs. And uh, looking for the warmth out there. We do have 60s not so far to the south. We're hanging in the low 50s. I believe it's a 51. In fact, let me, uh, let me even refresh the page here just to make sure I got the latest. Um, but we're, we're hanging in the low 50s. But it looks like Dulles is already at uh, 58 degrees, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, let's see if Tucker Barnes is over there. We can check together. Uh, let's see what I got. Yeah. And let's check on Dulles and see if Dulles is actually That'd be interesting if they're already shooting up that warm at just 11.14 in the morning. Yeah, 58 degrees. There you go, Dulles. 58 degrees at Dulles right now, but they are reporting a little bit of cloudiness out there at the moment. So, uh, again, warmer temps, and that's more due to the west wind than anything else today. A west wind is very warm. Let's go back to the mountain example again, just for fun, uh, and because I have time on this show, which is always nice. Uh, can't explain this on TV because there's not enough time. But basically, when we have a west wind, you got all these, I'll draw a few, you got all the mountains out to the west there. And winds come on this side, they go up the mountains, winds go up the mountains. And when things go up the atmosphere, there's less air above our head. So if you take an air mass and you move it up, uh, you know how at the top of the mountains, we always say air is thinner, so it has more room to expand. And the expanding process is a cooling process. So you're cooling things as the air moves up on the uh, western side of the mountains. But then it comes back down the other side of the mountains. It gets pushed down. 
and uh, that compression is a warming process. So everybody east of the Appalachians today is going through like this weak compression process uh, from the west wind coming straight off the mountains, and that's what's helping raise our temperature a little bit, uh, and is expected to get us up near, in some cases, even a little bit above 60 uh, by the time we get to this afternoon. Again, looking at the uh, meteograms, there's 62. It looks like down towards Richmond. There's uh, so it looks like the 60s are kind of hanging out down in this region right now, though again, uh, we do expect them to push a little farther north. Now, winds are going to get a little gusty. We do have uh, some gusty winds starting to be reported out to the west. All of those locations you see are reporting sustained winds. Oh, thing went a little crazy on me there. All those locations in uh, western PA, um, western portions of West Virginia, Maryland, Panhandle, even starting to see some gusty winds. Let me do. Uh, let me show you what the winds look like right now around the region. Uh, boop! Here they come. Uh, got nothing too extreme at the at the moment. Cumberland's gusting the 31. Hagerstown 31. I guess those are the most extreme we're seeing here in D.C. Nothing too bad. We're we're up to like 10, 15 mile an hour sustained wind, but nothing too gusty. Oh, beautiful shot here of uh, of the Capitol building with the clouds. There's a, a nice shot of what it actually looks like outside. That's a live shot from downtown showing the sky cover and uh, broken cloud cover at this hour but should be more sun through the afternoon so again winds nothing too terribly extreme at the moment but uh we should see those kick up a little more as we head into the afternoon all right real quick weather then we're going to talk a little bit about what it takes to get a decent november snowfall here in dc um quickly running through the kind of the rest of the week here that was this morning we had a little bit of shower activity it's gone uh, clouds thinning out and more sunshine coming in. Tomorrow should be sunny and bright, especially the first half of the day. High pressure is going to be sort of right on top of us. And then as we get into the afternoon, late afternoon, evening hours, clouds will start to build a bit ahead of our next storm. Saturday here, some good news for the weekend. I'll, I'll go into more details about the weekend tomorrow when we do weekend forecasts and beyond. Saturday now looking kind of uh, on the drier side of things. I won't rule out an isolated drizzle or shower, but uh, it looks drier than it did before. And the main wave of rain and showers doesn't look like it comes in until overnight into Sunday morning, early morning. And uh, even by the dawn hour, what's left of the rain should be on its way out. And then by the afternoon, we're clearing with a gusty and chilly northwest wind and temperatures are dropping all day on Sunday. That hasn't really changed. But just if you're wondering when the next chance for rain is, it's still Saturday, but it's more Saturday night than uh, Saturday day, if that makes sense at all. All right, now let's skip ahead and let's talk about uh, the fun stuff. November snow. Guess I figured today would be a good day to talk about it since I, it was sent by several different people, that article I read, um, which was cited weather.com's extended forecast for uh, having some snowflakes flying on Thanksgiving Day. The problem with a lot of those extended forecasts is that they just take raw weather model data, which is sort of what I'm showing you here, and they, they take it as fact and they throw it out there automatically. The computer does it all and they give you a forecast. And there was one model that, you know, I knew it was kind of crazy and Tucker knew it was kind of crazy. In fact, any DC meteorologist knew it was kind of crazy and nobody was forecasting snow for Thanksgiving. Um, uh, but someone wrote an article and put it out on social media that uh, snow would be possible on Thanksgiving Day. And there's a, a number of reasons why that won't be the case. This is Thanksgiving Day right here. What it does look like for Thanksgiving Day, and now I'm like Thanksgiving Day morning here, uh, is it does look cold. I'll pause it right there. This is the upper level pattern. Uh, it, by cold, I mean chilly. It doesn't look bone chilling cold. Uh, but a little trough across the eastern half of the United States there, generally speaking, sets us up for, for a cold. And, uh, just the general theme of uh, the ridge out west and then blocking up in Greenland. Uh, that's a pattern to me which suggests uh, cooling across the eastern half of the country. So uh, yeah, I do think we're cold. But I will say this, more and more models, and, and here's the European today. Uh, let me get you out to Thanksgiving Day. We'll just kind of skip ahead. Here's Thanksgiving afternoon. You don't see, we're obviously we're right here in uh, D.C in the black box there. Uh, you don't see any green, so today's European not calling for any rain. It's holding, uh, you, you look for the weaknesses in the pattern. So here's the pattern, the biggest weakness is across the Gulf. Uh, so that would be the best chance for, for seeing rain. So as we switch back to the operational, guess what? There's your where it's got the best chance of rain down there and that weakness across the Gulf. And it's uh, got high pressure in control here, cold area high pressure. But what it shows is a, um, 
in the area of, uh, of high pressure scooting across the Great Lakes. That's pulling in another strong northwest flow, so we're keeping it cool. But according to the European today, it's on the dry side of things. At one time it was wet, but today it's on the dry side of things. So some good news there. What interests me more in terms of November snowfall, and let me do a little disclaimer here before we move forward. Uh, I am not, and I, I want to get full screen here, not calling for any snowfall in, in D.C. in November um, yet, but I'm a pattern guy. I, I watch weather patterns. I'm a nerd. I'm a weather nerd. I'm a weather geek. Uh, and what we do is we, we look for patterns. We are, we are pattern matchers. It's like making a puzzle piece, find the pattern, and then forecast the storm. Um, so more and more as we head into November, you know, the winter months, December through November, December, January, February, we'll be watching for stormy patterns. Now, I will tell you this, and let me pull it back up. Uh, we are going to go out into the future 240 hours, 10 days from now. This is the pattern from the, Euro the European end of things. This is, uh, and if you don't know weather models, just know that in terms of rankings, we forecasters tend to like the European above the American. It's just better. It's got. It's all financial. The European more money in it, more money goes into it. It gets regular updates. Here in the United States, our model's good, but it's also government funded, which means sometimes the funds get washed up, it doesn't get updated as often, and um, the math is just generally better in the European. Uh, they just went through, I think, another update, so just recently they got another weather model update there from the European uh, Met Office. It, it's all because it's privatized. European data is very expensive. Uh, that's why you can't just Google look at the European model and find it online. Uh, for the more, most part. There are a few websites where you can find snippets of it, but you can't get the full data unless you're willing to pay. And it's a, uh, so that's why, you know, what, what I'm showing you here is pretty cool. Um, so here's the pattern 10 days from now. And if I, I'd be lying if I said I would be anything less than really excited if this was January and I saw this pattern setting up, nice ridge out west. Uh, but more importantly, you got a nice, Western-based NAO block. That's all this uh, red and orange up here. Uh, blocking pattern for cold. And the fact that it's extended, where it's extended, uh, like I'm going to outline kind of the, the ridge pattern there. That block is uh, textbook in terms of getting uh, cold air transport where it needs to be. Usually under this pattern, you have a nice area of high pressure here. That's a blocking high. And you're getting a nice big area of, uh, let me redraw here. So you're, you're typically getting a nice cold high, I'll put it in blue, sitting somewhere up across southern Canada. And you're typically getting a, a bigger, stronger high pushing down into the plain states. And that's your, those two, uh, the one pushing into the plains is your cold weather maker. And the one pushing into Canada is more of your, your blocking pattern. Same deal as before. Uh, that I mentioned for uh, the Thanksgiving thing. Look for the weakness in the ridge, and there's your trough right there. In fact, let me draw it in red. Your trough is right there. So just as a forecaster, and obviously the details will have to be worked out because this is 10 days away and models aren't the most accurate, but that would be the location where you'd want to develop a storm. And a lot of time when, when you develop a storm, they like to move up in that direction under this type of pattern. Again, if, if I saw this, it's November, which is unfortunate, but if this pattern repeats, it, repeats itself in January and February, I think we could have a party going, even if, the, if you're a snow lover. Um, if you're, uh, Kathy, I'm with you, fingers crossed. Um, if you're a November snow hopeful, meh, it's got potential. November snows tend to be surprises. Uh, it's... I would be shocked if we were able to predict any snow 10 days out in, in November because it just doesn't uh, present itself that well. But that from the European is a very interesting storm pattern. Now, subtle differences, especially this time of year, uh, or make all the difference. This is the uh, American version. So look, just look at it. So same time stamp, but that's American GFS. American GFS. American. In fact, i got to back it up one. So... Uh, I'm sorry, European, American, European, American, European, American. Differences are crucial. 
Uh, much weaker up here. Look how, watch the oranges there. See how the oranges and the, the yellows, the ridge, basically extends down in, in this one um, all the way to the southern half of Canada into the, the almost United States border with the ridge there. Well, if we go back to the American, not so much. It's more kind of limited to the edge of the, the um, Hudson Bay there. It's kind of right there at the edge of the Hudson Bay which is a much colder pattern for, you, for the eastern half of the United States. Uh, but it's also more of a Great Lakes bomber storm kind of thing. It, it's more taking, if, if there was a storm that was going to form, clear that off, if there was a storm that was going to form, it would probably form along the Appalachians and ride up, or it would kind of come out of Canada and scoot up a lot like the one last night did. Um, it w it'll go up through the Great Lakes, it'll go up across New England, or option three under this type of pattern is that you'll develop a storm and it'll be a very poorly developed storm uh, way down here in the Gulf, and then that will kind of scoot out and under the pattern because we'd just be too cold here. Too much cold air is not a good thing. You'll, you'll dry out the pattern and you'll push storms away. Uh, that would not be a good storm pattern. I think if you are hopeful for anything in November, you want the European to be right. But the problem is in the details. Again, this is an ensemble, which is a, a combination of a bunch of different models. Uh, 50 different runs, 51 different numbers, I think. So this is like an average of a bunch of model runs. The European operational is this. And it's trying to get the details, which look a little puzzling to me. I, it's got your Great Lakes bomber storm here uh, that's going to go up and, and come across. Um, but the details are, are different from its own ensemble. So look at the differences. There's, there's the ensemble. So that's European ensemble, European operation. Euro 1, Euro 2. Euro 1, you, ooh, Euro 1, Euro 2. Uh, the differences is that Euro 2, just like I, I explained, uh, for the Thanksgiving thing, is most of the, the storm energy is deflected too far south. You'll blow out the pattern, and any sort of moisture is going to slide south, and we'll, we'll stay cool but not cold here, and we won't have a coastal storm. If you want any, no any November snow at all, you want it to be a, uh, something going up the coast, which is, again, not a pattern that's very typical of late fall. That's, that's super rare. And how rare is it? Well, let's do that. Let's look at historical March snowfalls. Uh, in DC. Uh, I've sorted this little list by the most snow we've ever had, the, the top year, so to speak. Uh, a couple things you'll notice right off the bat, I hope I made that big enough, is look at the years. Um, I, I think this is every year that had over an inch of snow that fell during the month of November. And generally speaking, it, we, we don't get multiple events. The majority, I, I looked over all these years, um, the majority of, of these events uh, were one-day wonders, one or two-day wonders, all one storm. Um, no years, look at the years, none of them are from the year 2000 and, uh, and beyond. So we, we, none in recent memory. In fact, I, aside from, I'm trying to think of when the last time we had it was, I think 96 was the last time we had measurable snow, but I don't see... Let me, I'm just quickly kind of glancing here to see when the last time one of these one inch plus. I think 8990 might be the most recent. So, so 8788. Okay, so according to the National Weather Service, who is very good at what they do, the last time we had measurable an inch or more fall in the month of November was uh, before I was born. I was born in 1990, so it looks like November of 1989 was the last time we had any snow at all here in, uh, here in Washington, D.C., above an inch falling during the month of November. We've had traces, we've had snowflakes, we've had dustings, we've had less than an inch of snow, and I'll show you those in, in just a second here. Um, but according to uh, National Weather Service, we haven't had an inch or more of snow in D.C. in the month of November. It looks like, and again, I'm, I'm double taking a glance just to make sure I'm getting it right, but it looks like November of 1989 was the last time we had an inch or more fall in the month of November. So maybe you look at it as a, hey, we're due, um, and you know we'll keep our fingers crossed. 
so let's go through a, a couple of these. So um, let's look at the top five events that I can. And what I mean by I can is we have weather model data that goes back to the 1950s because of satellite. The satellite era is when we trust accurate uh, weather data. Um, so these events like 1938, 1939, I can't look at the pattern and deduce what, what happened with it. So we have to ignore it. Um, 53, 54 we can look at, but I can't look at 80, 1898, uh, 1899, a winter I remember so fondly. Um, so I, I can't look at that one, I can't look at that one, I can't look at 1904, it's too long ago. Um, and I can't look at 1908, I can't look at 1892. So I can look at these ones. <laughs> the top five of the satellite era are, are in order uh, from, from least to most. Uh, 1978 would be number five at 3.189, 3.5 inches. Uh, 1953, November 1953, 6.7 inches, 67, 6.9 inches of snow. And then 87, the whopper of them all, uh, which at the time was the most snow seen in November or December, 11.5. Since then, we've had the uh, blizzard of 2009 in December that kind of washed it out and uh, was the most snow, I believe, that DC's ever gotten in the month of December. Um, so let's look at the, let's look at what it takes to get from a pattern standpoint to get uh, November snow here in DC. So this was the first case. This was um, and let me I, I zoomed in a little too much, but you can see the dates at the bottom of your screen there. So this was November 26, November 27, 1978. 3.1 inches of snow uh, fell in DC. What I want this is uh, this is the upper level pattern. So this is is this map that uh, we went back in, and uh, looked at the. the oops, hold on one second. All right, perfect. All right, we're back. We're back. Okay. Um, so uh, again, it's this. This is the forecast pattern. This is the actual pattern. Um, for these years. So going back, let me, I lost my spot. There we go. Um, so this is 1978, November 26th and 27th. Big cold trough across the eastern half of the country. Big ridge up through Alaska. What I want you to notice here is look at your NAO. So nice big uh, block out in the Atlantic. But that's not for a, for a, I mean, there's a lot of cold air spilling down. That's probably a polar vortex situation. Um, and it's probably more just from, from glancing at the pattern with the ridge here, uh, it's probably more of, of something that clipped. And in fact, we can go this, so that's upper level. Let's go lower level. So uh, what's up, Tuck? So what we're looking at here is, uh, is pressure. So as I mentioned before, lots of cold air across the, uh, the northern half of the US. Your high pressure is going to be up there. You got a high pressure out here, not that that matters, but your area low pressure, and this is about as best we can do, is, uh, is somewhere in, in here. So it's still, it, it's probably one of these little guys that came down out the mountains. It probably went up and went out more straight across than coming up. Because if it had come up, we probably would have gotten more rain and snow. And from the reports I, see, I saw from, uh, from that date and time, um, it was a, a quieter storm, so to speak. So with, with the high outstretched like that across New England, I would suspect whatever area low pressure probably came and did something like that and kind of scooted itself right off the coast to the south of us, putting us on the cold side of the storm and giving us the snow. Good pattern, but not the best. Uh, this is number four, moving along in our list. Notice the things I we talked about a little bit in um, with the pattern that we're, we're watching right now. Look at the NAO. So if you, you haven't gotten the picture just yet about how important that NAO is, which is that block up there across Greenland, the reds and the oranges, this guy in the, uh, in the model world here, right there, uh, it's vitally important not just in, um, not just in, uh, in November snows, but all snowstorms. You want that to be active if you want something big. Uh, big trough, maybe another polar vortex situation. Nice ridge up through the west. Nice, uh, nice trough there in, in Alaska. Um, not the most similar pattern to, to this, and I'm going to drag this guy over. 
Um, but I, some of the features are, features are a little similar. I mean, you got the ridge out west. See the pattern here? You got the ridge out west a little bit. You got the block up north, but there's no connection there. Um, and this is the GFS, uh, so it's the more aggressive of the two in terms of the cold. But uh, you get the point. There, some of the features are, are there at the very least. Um, let's see. Good day, Benji. What's up? Uh, let's move in to, uh, to what went on at the surface. This is, uh, for some of these weather models, I'm able to grab from uh, the Penn State Meteorology site their reanalysis, and it's kind of clear to see. Um, you had high pressure. See all the H's up to the north there. That's where you want high pressure for a nice big storm. And here you had low pressure coming right up the coastline. So you most obviously had a storm follow the green contours, come up and do one of those. And more than likely, given where this high is and that high is and how the ridge is, is kind of set up, you, you had one of those kind of go up the coastline. So that was probably a pretty good storm for those off to the north. Here, I believe, what did I say, 3.5 inches of snow fell in 1978. Moving on, next storm, mm, not so much in the NAO department. I mean, there, there's blocking there. That's more of a, what we call AO. I, I don't want to get too technical. Uh, but just know that there's a decent block over the Hudson Bay, and you see the cold here to the south. This strikes me as another situation where, where it was probably a little bit of a scooter. I'm trying to, this was 1953, so uh, quite some time ago. And there's the pattern. Um, so this tells me that I, obviously you have a big monster high, uh, just dominant. You probably had two. You probably had one here and you had one dipping into the plain states here. Um, low pressure coming down out of Florida probably scooted the coastline close enough that we got that light fluffy snow. Um, and I believe this was, uh, let's see, this was 1953, which means I'm going to have to shrink the screen. 1953, we got 6.7 inches of snow. So maybe it didn't. Maybe it came a little closer than I'm thinking. Again, I, we don't have the exact. 1953 is a long time ago, so we don't have the the same weather uh, maps and weather detail that we did back in 1953. But uh, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I believe that's 1953 right there. So there's the surface. Um, so I again. I, Classic setup. I, I'm almost certain that you had two blocking highs like that, and you had low pressure riding up at least close enough that we get, got into some decent, we got half a foot of snow, so uh, some decent snow bands there. So that's a setup that's, that's worth watching for halfway decent snows. Um, so Hudson Bay blocking. I mentioned the keys between the two. Um, here's European again. Notice the, the NAO over, that extends over the Hudson Bay block right there. The extent of the block is the key there in the European, whereas with the American, the block is not as extensive. It tends to stop there at the Hudson Bay. Um, now, that has a little similar look to... Uh, so I'll put it side by side. So look where the block is there. Some similarities, but probably not. So I wouldn't say we're looking at something like, like that. Moving on, two more to go. This was uh, 67, and in 67, we got 6.9 inches of snow. So almost 7 uh, inches of snow in uh, 1967. Let's zoom in on it here. Uh, this is a weird pattern. Uh, I don't like it at all. I'm... Uh, I'm surprised we got that much snow out of it. Um, big Bering Sea Ridge, which is something that we've had a lot of so far this fall. Uh, nice big trough out west, which is not something we're setting up for. A nice big trough up to the north. Um, this just, it looks like a, a, it's certainly a crazy cold pattern. I mean, you have a lot of blocking up here, so you're doing a big time troughing situation across the whole of the United States. Um, and it looks to me like there's warmth down here, there's cold up here. So you probably had a, a, some sort of a stalled frontal boundary uh, with a storm that formed along it and went up a little bit, is my guess. Um, that's the, how things looked at the surface. These are pressure uh, anomalies, by the way, if I didn't explain that before. Um, so there is an area of low pressure. I, you, you, you see what I, what I wrote here, where the warmth is here, the cold is here. So somewhere in between there is where you'd get the front. Um, so somewhere in that area, there, there's 
up front where an area low pressure likely developed and then rode up and out. Um, again, 67s, unfortunately, before we have the best data in the world and we don't have the, the reanalysis model that goes back that far, so I'm not exactly sure what happened. Um, but low pressure looks like it, it probably, based on this, it probably developed somewhere in Texas, rode up the Appalachians, and then it probably did a redevelopment out to the coast and went up and out. That would be my guess. And again, I'm just kind of figuring this out as we go. I, I could be totally wrong. But based on the pressure anomalies during that time and the amount of snow we got, which was almost seven inches, that strikes me as a case where an interior storm phased the coast and then went up. Those are some of our biggest snowfalls. It, uh, the, uh, the February blizzards in 2010 did that. The January blizzard in 2016, just a few years ago, did that. Those phasing blizzards are super rare in November, that's for sure. I mean, we've only gotten one or two. Um, but uh, uh, what was I? I lost my train of thought. Process. That, I'm just kind of guessing there, guys. I, an educated guess, but it's a guess. Um, all right, uh, last one, the big one, the granddaddy of them all, the biggest snow we've ever had in November, uh, three years before I was born, November of 1987. Uh, this was the pattern the day of the event, November 11th, Veterans Day. Uh, big blocking ridge out to the west. Again, let's, let's look at the similarities. Um, there you go, nice in the, uh, in the current model, nice big block out here. Um, and then nice weakness, look where your weakness in the trough is, your nice weakness over the southeast U.S. Let's go back to the European, uh, nice weakness there, right? So, uh, okay, pluses, we're cooking with gas a little bit here. Um, and there it is. I love the Mikey T show. Me too. There's the nice big, uh, nice big storm, let me zoom it in. Big coastal storm right off the uh, right off the coastline here, redeveloped, and it was a two-pronged event, a lot like January of 2016 was here, where you had a uh, weaker area low pressure ride up, and then behind it you had a stronger area low pressure redevelop and kind of sit and spin for a little bit off the Delmarva coastline. So you just got a heavy band of snow, and in fact, instead of me telling you about it. How about we let our, our own Sue Palka tell you about it? Uh, she, was, she was here at, on that day. She was working on that day. And uh, let me take you to some video we have here uh, way back from 1987, November 11th of 1987. Fox 5 Zone Sue Palka doing a little, little breaking news. Take a look at the temperatures that we recorded today for highs. Very chilly. We did not get above freezing at National Airport. Dulles 31, BWI 31 degrees, lows in the 20s. This is more snow than we've ever had in November. The last time we had this much snow was November 30th, 1967. It is more snow than we've ever even had in December. The most snow we ever had in December was on December 17th, 1932, when we had 11 and a half inches. Will we have this much snow tomorrow? I sure hope not. I'll have answers for you when we return. a little bit more than that, too, but for the most part, the heavy snow is over, and yes, it was very heavy in a bullseye right over the Washington area. The district, Fairfax, southern Montgomery County, into, uh, into even into Prince George's. I think Prince George's really got knocked uh, for a loop with the heavy snow they had over there and down into northern Charles County. Then you go just across the bay, and they had a half inch to an inch of snow. Uh, beyond the district, almost every time we have a storm, we say the heaviest snow fell north and west of the city. That was not the case with this storm. Four to nine inches, widely varied, but then as you got farther to the west, one to four inches, and of course last night in a totally separate storm, Garrett County in Maryland had up to nine inches of snow. The uh, mostly sunny skies tomorrow, the storm is going to move well off the coast, but we're going to get a lot of winds around that as well as around the high pressure, so a sunny but windy day and a chilly day too. We'll look for a high in the 40s in the suburbs, maybe 50 degrees downtown, and then we'll start seeing some of these 60s in the next day or so. Sunrise, sunset tomorrow, 647 and 457. 59 and 41 degrees are the normals, and of course, this has not been normal. <laughs> not at all. Overnight lingering flurries, maybe an accumulation of an inch or less in some areas still coming.
All right, and we're going to end it there. I mean, oh my goodness, 1980s television graphics at their best right there. And uh, I like how the forecast just says 60s coming up. Wish we could be uh, that general. There's some live uh, live photo, and this is from, i got to give a shout out to Skyhawk2959, who uh, this was footage from Columbia, Maryland that year, 1987. Uh, of the biggest snowstorm DC has ever seen. Uh, here's the map of, of the snow totals. And by the way, guys, it, it was a pretty small area that saw that, that extreme amount of snow. Really just extreme, uh, well, downtown DC, a foot plus in a lot of locations, uh, 11 and a half inches officially in the city, but many parts of the city, especially eastern parts of the city, got over an inch. Uh, a stripe of Prince George's County got 14 to 16 inches. And then, um, believe it or not, east it, it, totals dropped off real quick as we got away on both sides from the I-95 corridor. Portion, portions of Upper Montgomery County only got three to four inches of snow. Um, Frederick uh, County in Maryland only got an inch or two. And then the same deal as you got close to the bay. You got towards Charles County, Calvert County, St. Mary's County. They only got a couple of inches. And then across the bay, they got almost nothing. So it was pretty much just one heavy band of snow that set up over Washington, D.C., and it just snowed all day that day. So they're a little fluky, these, uh, these November snowstorms. Occasionally, they, <laughs> they happen. Again, the last time uh, I have in my little system here that we got, uh, that we got snow of above an inch falling in November was 1989. So it's been a while. What, what is that, 25, 30 years? So uh, it, it's been a long time. Um, is this supposed to be Prince George's? Modern art is absurd. Uh, no, that's not modern art. That's that's old. That last photo was from 1987. What's up, Pete? By the way. Um, <clears throat> so um, uh, again, November snows are, are super rare here. It's not super rare that we get snow falling in November, though. It just doesn't always stick. We average uh, in the month of November a trace of snow here in D.C. So we get um, uh, a at least some flakes in the, in the typical uh, average La Nina year. Wouldn't shock me if we see them before this month is out. Um, still would be surprised. Again, it's worth watching that little pattern uh, as we get beyond the Thanksgiving period to see if maybe we can spin something up, but I wouldn't put too much faith in it. Uh, November just haven't been too kind to us in the past 30 years uh, of uh, in terms of snowfall. So that, that's all I got for today, guys. Tomorrow we'll keep it much quicker. We'll do a, a look at your weekend forecast. We'll look at Thanksgiving. It'll be in our seven day. And, and uh, speaking of our seven day, oh, the ticket got uh, taken down on me. Uh, I wanted to show our seven day, but uh, today's pretty nice. And I'll, I'll kind of part to on you with uh, on th with this. A look outside. Uh, one more time of the. Uh, let's go to the White House. Um, there you go. We got a live look. We got the sun broke, breaking through in spots. We do have a mixture of clouds out there. And uh, overall, it should be a nice day, a milder day. Temperatures again near 60 at Dallas already. Um, and then cold comes back tonight into tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning will be uh, uh, quite chilly. So get ready for that. All right, that's it. That's, I'm done for the day. Molly's on her way back. She's going to have more news headlines and uh, more of what's going on around town today. Coming up in just a few more minutes. So sit tight. Uh, thanks for uh, for tuning in here, and I will see everybody tomorrow and get you ready in the weather department for the weekend. All right, guys, take care. Have yourselves a great Thursday. Get ready for Friday. TGIF.
All right, hey guys, hey Pete. I'm really sorry that this music scares the dickens out of you. I will tell you, I just cracked up for like five minutes with that comment, but thanks guys for staying on uh, through Mike's weather hit and while I set up some of the stories for today. We're gonna show you sort of an inside look on Capitol Hill right now. They're waiting for President Trump's arrival on the Hill um, and we're gonna be kind of following the news of the day and uh, going around to see what we got going on. So I'm gonna set up some stories, so stay on with us. Obviously, uh, welcome to the news part of the show as we go into the afternoon. We're gonna be talking about some social media viral videos, some President Trump tweets as always, um, some other funny stuff that's been happening in the social media world. And then you got a live look at our newsroom today on uh, this Thursday, November 16th. So welcome and thanks for hanging out. Hey, Kathy. Yeah, happy Friday tomorrow. Um, and to anybody else who's on, I kind of was scrolling through the comments. Yeah, bear me, with me as I set up some stuff and um, I'll show you what's going on in Capitol Hill. Looks like some reporters are getting some people to talk as they wait for the president. He knows we're gonna get this done. Can you describe the mood in the room? Uh, the mood in the room was extraordinarily optimistic. Uh, we know we have to get this done and delivered to hardworking Americans across the country. And you know, a lot of satisfaction and uh, you know, we're just all very pleased that it's come together the way it has. Thank you. Good, thanks everyone. Oh yeah, keep going. It looks okay to me. Yeah. I, I was looking in the monitor here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Looks functional. We have a chance to do something really good for the American people, and uh, we need to get it across the line. He's optimistic about the process going on in the Senate as well, that they'll produce a product, pass it, we'll have something to negotiate with in conference, and we can get it done. So it was very upbeat, very positive. Did he give you um, any idea if he wants to see an individual mandate repeal? He didn't. He stayed out of that sort of discussion, I think appropriately so. I mean, there'll be a time for him to weigh in, but that's probably once we actually get into a conference committee. So uh, I think he likes both products. They both are within the framework that uh, we agreed upon first in the summer and common principles and then outlined. So, uh, there's certainly things here that are negotiable, and so I think we should end up with a good product. I thought he said something about how this sounds feels nothing like health care. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did, and and that's a that's a general sentiment in the room. I mean, this has been you know a complex and difficult process, but uh, 
the health care thing was tougher all the way through, and this is something I think, honestly, our members are very enthusiastic about, really believe need to happen, and probably, uh, you know, it's an area that everybody feels like they have at least some expertise and competence in, certainly the President of the United States is a successful business person does. So, uh, uh, you know, we think uh, this is a, a little bit easier to deal with. How big of a day is it for us? Huge day for us. I mean, uh, we've had a lot of good days, but uh, this time it's not a question of just getting it through the House. We think we really have a good opportunity to work with the Senate and get a final product to the uh, the President's death. And nobody's done this since 1986. So this is a generational opportunity for our speaker, certainly for our members on Ways and Means, but I think for the whole conference. I think it's really important for the country. And, and what do you expect from the vote today? Uh, I think we'll win, uh, you know, a substantial vote. There'll be some folks that, uh, you know, have concerns, and that's legitimate. But uh, anything north of 218 makes me very happy, and we will be north of 218. And did anything about the sexual harassment with Senator Frank? No, none of that was discussed at all. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Thank you, Congressman. Mm -hmm. That's cold, Tom Cole. Sorry, I'm all over you. No, no, I'm commenting on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to sweat it up all the time. You've been fine. You've been fine. So, definitely, hopefully, Brady maybe comes out this time. Carson, is there anything that you're still in touch with? All good. I guess we could, uh, yeah, I don't know that, you know, usually these things are off the record, but uh, the president came up and just, he, he, he thanked Kevin Brady, uh, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee for Putting the bill together, and he uh, um, encouraged the Republican conference to, to to pass the bill today. And it was a very positive meeting. Uh, he's still in there taking photographs and selfies with people. Um, very upbeat. Uh, very anticipative of a, uh, a positive vote later on this afternoon. Great. So he's still in there taking pictures. He's still in there, and uh, everybody's in a very jovial, positive mood. Uh, uh, the president did not take questions. Um, it, was, it was basically, we appreciate what the House Republicans are doing. We think it's it's good to lower the taxes for uh, uh, for all the, the working Americans, and uh, looks forward to a big positive vote. And I think it will pass. Yeah. Was the majority of his remarks about tax reform? Well, you know, he made some 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 comments about specific congressmen and that he knows personally but it was yeah his main message was uh, uh, we really need to do tax reform this is a good bill uh, he knows that there'll probably be some changes between the house version and the senate version but a very very positive uh, let's get it done did he say anything about health care and how this might be different yeah we just we t he focused on uh, on, on, on tax reform, and, um, and again, he was very positive, very uh, uh, laudatory of the uh, Republican leadership and Chairman Brady, uh, and, and, and did ask us to vote yes on the bill, and a lot of applause, and a very, it's, a, it's a very uh, very good feeling, very positive, very very united. But he didn't say that this really? felt different than health care? He, we, we, he didn't comment on health care. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, we're back in the newsroom. It's Molly here. So, Kathy, it's really funny that you would mention Kim K. I guess she's on The Real today, so you must be uh, watching Fox, because that's on Fox. Um, she made, did you guys know this? She made $10 million in a day selling her perfume, and the people, the consumers, the buyers, hadn't even smelled her perfume yet. That's the latest. We're going to talk more about this when we talk social news and social videos, but basically, I'll tease it a little bit. Her fragrance hit the online world yesterday, and customers had to choose between three different fragrances. Um, 300,000 bottles were produced, and uh, they're expected to sell out by tonight. So let me know what you think about that. 
Would you guys buy one? I, I was seeing on Instagram earlier that was saying she was really into savory um, aromas, so stuff like truffles and like food. So I'm a little wary about what those might smell like, but that's just me. Anyway, $10 million in a day. I would like to have that. That's pretty nice. Um, I want to show you guys this other viral video too. This was in Texas. Hang on. Let me find it. This was our, our senior web producer's favorite story of the morning, guys. Check it out. Okay, so this guy basically was followed by police, hunted down by canine dogs, and then he just starts, he sees a um, rumble strip get put down to stop his car, and he just starts busting a move. So this is his dance for the police. Check it out. Yeah, so anyway, this, this video is going viral on social media, and like I said, our people loved it this morning. I don't know if the guy might be on drugs or something, but definitely uh, an interesting one that's making the rounds on the interweb. So let me know what you think about that. Um, hey, Kyle. <laughs> and let me show you also this, guys. This is another one that's making the rounds. Okay, so... You guys probably know, I'm gonna take myself off so you can see, but John Cleese from Monty Python and so many other British comedies, he tweeted this out, basically that he lost his diary somewhere in DC, Richmond or Nashville, and uh, people are loving it. There are people all over sort of the web and Reddit looking for this for him, especially it's relevant because we're in DC, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, if someone finds it, they get a reward and a kiss from John Cleese, according to his tweet. So it's a cute one. Uh, from the celeb world. Obviously, I'm following a bunch of celebrity news today. It's just what we're doing, so we keep it varied. Um, what you saw earlier, guys, was uh, a stakeout on the Hill. The House tax reform vote is today, so we're going to be kind of jumping back in and out of that on Capitol Hill to kind of see what people are saying. Um, it all comes down today. They're in the House, so that's what uh, the reporters were kind of getting, some of those guys on. Um, Kathy, I'm reading this. Yeah, totally doesn't surprise me. For celebs and perfume, Kim K came out with one many years ago, and I remember getting my hands on one, and um, let's just say I wasn't too keen on it, but um, I don't know. I'd be willing maybe to try this out, and what else is going on? Yeah, I don't know, Pete. I don't know what, what would have happened there. That would have been bad. Bad news um, if they had shot him, but... Just a funny story to spice up your morning. Um, we have some people coming up on Capitol Hill, so we're going to jump over there. I stand like that this on the other side. That looks great. That's better. That's perfect. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Like a director of Fellini. Just call me Fellini. Chip's going to be starting our new lighting gallery. Yes.
All right, guys, let's pull it out of that story and talk about yesterday's um, event. Did you catch the end of the stream yesterday? I know a lot of you guys were on yesterday. We put up sort of already in progress the press conference with those UCLA freshman basketball players who came back from China after having shoplifted um, and essentially President Trump helped them come back and not face charges in China. And this is what he tweeted six hours ago today. And this is kind of making the rounds as well. People are talking about what he tweeted, basically saying, you can read from the bottom up. He says, to the three players, I say, you're welcome. Go out and give a big thank you to the president of China who made your release possible. Have a great life. Be careful. Many pitfalls on the long and winding road of life. Quoting the Beatles a little bit there. Um, some people saying... This was harsh of him to tweet right away like this. He should have given them some time to say thank you to him. Some saying, no, this was deserved. These these guys should, the first thing they should have said was, hey, thank you to our president or the president for letting this happen. Let us know what you think. I don't know if some of you caught that. We caught the tail end of that press conference yesterday, but um, that was an interesting one and a talker because these guys came forward and basically apologized for what happened. and didn't face longer um, penalty in China, which is pretty interesting. Um, yeah, let us know what you think, guys. We're going to be following other tweets and viral videos and anything that kind of comes up, um, putting together some stuff as we speak. And uh, we have a lovely shot of the Capitol up. So I'm going to show you that for just a second as we kind of prep for the day. We're going to have um, our social media editor come over and chat some more stories that she's working on too, guys. And... I'm gonna show you something really fun today in the um, today here at Fox 5 in the loft we had um, Janet Jackson's dancers some of her dancers were here and our anchor you probably saw her yesterday Allison Seymour took a cool live video of it Janet Jackson is in concert tonight in DC and this is a cool video 
um, from this morning. So check it out while we prep some other stuff. This was this morning on Good Day DC. So don't you fire up yours either. I don't. No, Janet is not here. She is, I'm sure, resting or spending time with her. Yeah, but her dancers are here and her DJ is here. So, guys, that's Allison obviously narrating um, the dancers who are about to come on. And we're going to let you watch a little more and then we'll switch it out. Sorry, you guys, I'm on early. Sorry, you guys, I'm early. I thought they were coming up sooner. So, we're just all sitting in the loft waiting for the dancers are you going to the show tonight um that's janet jackson's dj today but we do need a dj remember we had dj friday that was fun okay so we're just waiting what's on everybody's mind what are you guys doing today? oh he says stand by okay okay here we go three two Thank you. 
awesome dancing. So I, I it's a choreography. Does Jenna have a hand in that? Uh, yeah, like obviously a lot of the choreography is years and years old, but it's cool to bring a different kind of uh, more modern flavor to it. And I love that you know you have a group of dancers that well you know you guys look all different, and I love that. And you're all about inclusivity. Uh, what is it like working with her, especially because she is known for such a physical show? Oh, it's amazing, but it is really hard. <laughs> I'm not even lying; it's really hard, but it's like the best experience I've ever had. I bet, I bet. And what is it? How long did you dance with Janet? Oh, uh, I started in 2015. I started in all of us, and at the same time, I'm unbreakable with her. Yeah. yeah. What was that like? How has it been? It's been amazing. I mean, it's she's an icon in all of our dreams come true. So it's and we're all family. So yeah. we're doing it with your family. Yeah, I'm, right. I'm wondering that. You know, you're you're obviously with your sisters here, and you guys yeah. are doing the same. Hey. All right, guys, so that was Allison's video from this morning of Janet Jackson's dancers. A little inside look at the loft. Actually, inside look in the newsroom. Hello. Rob, Hi, I, I always want him to come over, but he's always so busy in TOC. I have to work. I have to put the he stuff actually that you has see to do work. in there to go through here. But I'd like, because you guys want to see some faces in the newsroom, and so I'd like I like when people come over. Yeah. I'm literally yeah. over here in the corner, but I, I really invite and welcoming people. And I love to be a guest with you. Yeah. I'm going to come in a little earlier. I'm going to sit down. We're gonna talk. Mm -hmm. Talk. We'll, we'll have coffee. He loves It'll his New fun. Jersey roots. Or wait, is it New York? <laughs> we're having a little Thanksgiving okay. gathering in the newsroom today. Are you and contributing gonna... to that? Are you gonna go? You're gonna contribute by eating. I'm gonna put my jacket down. That's where I'm gonna contribute. <laughs> All right. And everybody have a good day. All right. See ya. <laughs> he loves contributors anyway. That's Rob. That's what I do. In TOC. Yeah, he has a great beard. Totally. <laughs> anyway, he'd love to hear that. All right. So. That was a little inside look at the loft, which is really fun. We get you know, all the cool featurey kind of stories, musical guests, artists, food stories in the mornings. And I'm trying to queue up another one for you guys, also having to do with President Trump. Trying to get it. I'm having some internet issue because everything we're grabbing is on all these different screens. If I could show you, actually, I do. Let me show you. This is cool. If I flip it around, all right, selfie style. You can, this is cool, this is my camera, but you can kind of see what I'm looking at by seeing what's on the phone, if you can see it. It's a bunch of different screens, and there it is. So I am just in the lights. Anyway, I'm trying to queue up this thing. It's taken a second to show you, but let me know what you guys want to talk about too. Let the chat continue, and um, whatever you want to talk about, just let me know. We'll comment, we'll chat it up. And um, soon, I told you I'm going to have Raisa over here, the social media editor. We're going to talk about what's going viral, what's going, what's popping on social media, on Instagram um, and Twitter today as far as stories. Um, and one of them, which I'm trying to get up, when I do, I'll come back and, and hit you guys, um, has to do with free speech. It's free speech, and it sort of all erupted in Texas, another Texas story um, that has been sparking a debate today. So we're going to go over there in a second. Um, Another live look at some of the hallways in the Capitol, guys. Check out these columns. There you go. This is a live camera. We'll leave you here for just a sec.
All right, guys, so some of you are asking about the screens. I know, Aaron, you said it would be fun to operate. Yeah, I would say it's super fun. There's a lot in front of me that you guys don't see, which is cool, and that's why I did that little inside glimpse. But um, Kathy asking if I get a headache. I mean, there's definitely a lot of lights, so I gotta be hydrated, and I got my Sampel right here. So who else loves this stuff? I, I always have. It's super good. But um, I wanna show you quickly, because the president is arriving on Capitol Hill. Check it out, this is a live look where he is, uh, they're waiting, they're staking it out, and um, see what we can see from here. And then if it gets sort of dry, we'll switch it up. I have another story for you coming up. Doing good, doing good. Hey, you did a great job on Saturday. I don't know if I told you that or not, but you did. Yeah, hey, I'm over here at the, outside the Capitol for the Trump's departure. We just had another set of cars pull in, and it looks like they're the ones that uh, the Vice President will be riding in. Do you hear anything about him being up here also? Okay. Sure thing. Yeah, they they just arrived and they were empty. They weren't in, uh, in there, but uh, you know, they got the flags up on the front. So it says, yeah. All righty. Great thing. Yeah, guys, so it looks like they're looking, like you mentioned, you guys are mentioning, they're looking for the president's car and seeing which one he may come out of. Uh, that's a gorgeous shot, though. I always love when the cameras are right he right there outside the Capitol. It's a really pretty day today in D.C. So that's what you're looking at, guys, a live look outside the front steps there. Um, yeah, and you just explained what happened yesterday. I was going to kind of talk about this story. So people in the newsroom were all chattering about it yesterday when President Trump needed water, and then he fumbled, exactly, couldn't find his water and grab, they grabbed a Fiji water for him. So I knew your joke. I knew what you meant when you said you were drinking Fiji. I'm going to stick to my Italian sparkling, personally. Um, all right, guys, a few more, and then we're going to switch stories um, in a little bit to talk more social 
media and what's sort of sparking debate in the um, in the social world and the online world as well. All right, guys. So back in the newsroom. So guys, uh, you're mentioning the Marco Rubio tweet, which is actually really funny because um, he and you guys are saying that he didn't handle it as well years ago. But Rubio actually uh, tweeted out humorously that he did it better a few years ago by keeping his eye to the camera. So that's actually pretty coincidental, funny that you would say that. Um, so anyway, some jokes ensuing with uh, Senator Marco Rubio and President Trump. Um, in serious news, though, guys, we've been talking about sexual assault allegations all week. Um, working on the Hill to create reforms uh, for sexual assault and harassment in the workplace, in lawmakers offices, everything. Breaking a developing story today is that KABC radio host Leanne Tweeden is now go going public saying that um, Al Franken, then comedian, now senator, groped her in 2006 in the Middle East. So we're going to play out what she had to say, some of her remarks uh, from today. This is just developing. Uh, had come along and he had written some skits for himself to do for the troops and um, he had done some research I hadn't met him before but he had done some research and found out that I was going to be the co MC with him and he had written a skit um, to include me I guess and, and he said you know oh I wrote a skit with you in it if you would like to take part in it and you know I said okay I'm game with that you know fine um, he had written a skit that was you know full of sort of sexual innuendos or whatever, you know, we were going to play along for the troops or what have you. And uh, he had written a scene that involved a, a, a kissing scene. And um, before our first tour stop in Kuwait, 
uh, we were backstage getting ready. Um, we had a little backstage area set up uh, alone um, but right before we went on because it was just the two of us that were going to come in from the backstage area. And he said, we, we really need to rehearse this scene. And I said, oh, okay, I don't think we really need to rehearse this. And I sort of blew him off. And he said, no, we really need to rehearse the scene. And, you know, I kind of said, all right, you turn right. I'll turn my head right. And we got this. And he really was very insistent and persistent. And um, he really kept going and said, we need to rehearse. And, you know, in my mind, I was never going to kiss him on stage. I mean, it was just sort of a like a gag thing. You know, I would do the, the old Bob Hope thing where I would just sort of turn my head or I would put my hand over his mouth and sort of, you know, do the, 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 the gag for the, the laughs for the troops, right? Well, he came at me backstage and, it, you know, as we were, I said, okay, we'll just, we'll practice the kiss, for goodness sakes, just to sort of shut him up. And he came at me and before I even knew it, he, he grabbed the, he put his hand on the back of my head and came towards me and, and mashed his face against my mouth and, and stuck his tongue in my mouth. And, you know, I sort of pushed him back and I said, don't ever do that to me again. And I was so angry and I walked out of there. And then, of course, you know, five minutes later, we're on stage and I had to be an actress, which I'm not. I'm a, you know, TV and radio host and had to act for the rest of the 10 days while we're on you know, stage together doing these shows for the troops and um, the you know, had to deal with him for the rest of the trip. I made sure I was never alone with him again. And uh, on our way home, we're on a C-17 for the 36-hour trip for myself back home to L.A. I'm asleep uh, on the plane, and the photographer of the trip was, you know, taking behind-the-scenes photos or whatever. And then I was given a photo that I didn't look at until I was home. Uh, I open it up, and there's all these photos of me on the trip. And then as I get to the photos at the very end of the trip, I'm asleep. I have a Kevlar helmet on and a flak vest on because when you're taking off from Afghanistan, there's always the potential of small arms fire when you're taking off and you could be shot through the plane so you wear your armor. And I'm asleep literally on the plane and there's a picture of Al Franken sort of doing this, grabbing my boobs, you know, over my flak vest and sort of looking at the camera and doing the smile um, so that I would see that when I got home. And, you know, it was just this sort of combination of the, you know, sticking his tongue down my throat and then the photo that I would see after I got home and just sort of how he treated me on the entire trip. And, you know, and, and the why now, I'll answer that. You know, the times have changed. I wanted to come out with the story when I got home 10 years ago and I was discouraged from doing that and I thought it would hurt my career. And, you know, um, I thought it would hurt my career. And a lot of my friends, all my friends knew about it. And my, my then boyfriend, now husband and father of my children really said, well, probably not a good thing because, you know, back then, even though you're the victim, it was all gonna come down on you. And I was gonna look like the bad girl. I was the model. I was the swimsuit model uh, before I got into television. And it, I was gonna be the bad girl. I was the one that was gonna be hurt from it and nothing was gonna happen to him. And now, you know, everything's different. Since Harvey Weinstein came out and, and there's strength in numbers. And then we had Congresswoman Jackie Spear come on our show a week ago. And she talked about being assaulted in Congress. And she said, uh, you know, when she was a young congressional aide, uh, her chief of staff, when she was in her 20s, stopped her in a hallway and grabbed her by the head and kissed her on the lips and stuck his tongue in her mouth. And all I thought was, that was Al Franken to me. And I said, you know what? I have to speak out now. This is my time. I'm going to come out with the story because I don't want this to happen to anybody else. And if I can come out now and tell my story, and if he's done this to somebody else, Maybe somebody else will have the courage to come out in real time and not hold this in for 10 years and have the anger and the humiliation and the shame that I had for 10 years and, and not, not hide it. I, I'm done with it. I moved on with my life, but I'm coming out with it now so I can be done with it. And, and, and you know, maybe he can't get away with it anymore. Yeah, it's really illuminating, guys. Um, I see some of your comments talking about how creepy it sounded. I'm curious if you guys think um, this is going to continue. People are going to um, come out with these stories. Like Leanne just said, um, and I have Risa joining me in a second, our social media girl. She can join in on this conversation, too, talking about sexual assault um, in the workplace and women having a hard time, right, coming forward about it. 
thinking they're going to be pushed under the bus. They're not going to get ahead with their bosses. Hey, Raisa. Hi. Raisa's back, guys. We're going to talk some social media. But I'm curious if you guys think this is, is a good thing. People are going to keep coming out about this and feel confident to come out that these people ass assaulted them in a past life, even though this was 12 years ago or so. Yeah. Um, and if you think it's a good thing um, that this is all happening and yeah, just keep the comments flowing. I'm curious what you think about it. Um, yeah, Benji, it totally does seem to me that everyone is coming out now with, mm -hmm. hey, I was groped or, or it's it touched inappropriately by some mm -hmm. person in power. Yeah. And they're finally feeling empowered to mm -hmm. say that. Isn't that interesting? And it took one person and I don't know how the cycle started, but I feel like that's, it's awesome. I'm so happy that women and men are coming out and speaking about these yeah. horrible incidents that have happened. Yep. And, um, you know, hopefully it sheds light on this mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. or, or, you know, matter. Yeah, Iran, really good comments, guys. Harassment a dirty is a dirty secret in D.C. as much as it was in Hollywood. And it's funny, yeah. even, uh, not funny, but you know what I mean, Alain Tweeden, mm -hmm. uh, like I said, this funny radio host in L.A. saying, um, even referencing Jackie Spear, who was on the Hill mm -hmm. saying in front of Congress, in front of people publicly at that hearing, hey, I was a young congressperson and this is what happened. And she mm -hmm. opened up. So it does sort of traverse entertainment, Hollywood and politics. And, and now the trickle down, like I was saying, every day this week, people are coming forward, coming forward. And you know, I, just to be super frank and honest, I understand what she was saying. When you're young and in your yeah. career and, in, and as a woman, yeah. I see her point of being like, well, I'm gonna brush this under the rug because I need to keep getting ahead or I need exactly. to do this. I don't wanna be seen like this. It's gonna look bad. I'm gonna, I'm gonna miss this next jump in my career. Absolutely. And that's exactly what she said. She just came forward. So again, really happy to be able to bring you that video that was just today, really developing news mm -hmm. um, that this radio host was is uh, alleging that Al Franken, then a comedian, now a senator, groped her in 2006 uh, during a tour in the Middle East. So mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see what he kind of responds to that right. too. I always like hearing the responses. Yeah. I, I, I want to know. Yeah. It's, so. And we've seen some apologies. We've seen other people mm -hmm. admit. Other people say, no, this didn't happen. So it's, yeah. it is really interesting to see. You the, just never know. The, you're right. Are they pass the reaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so interesting. Um, Kathy saying, yeah, after the Kevin Spacey explosion, it's open. Yeah. Totally true. Really yeah. interesting. And the Harvey Weinstein explosion, we took that. I know Good Day was all over that. Our Fox mm -hmm. 5 DC news crew in the morning was yeah. talking about that story right as it happened and throughout the week week and um, it was just slowly exploding that week. Absolutely. Um, you talked it's about it on your mm -hmm. show too. Yeah, we talked about it a little bit. Hey, Schultz, good to see you on. Um, totally true. Yeah, really true statement there, Iran, saying that the harassment is is true really in so many facets of life, but Hollywood, DC, mm -hmm. it's one and the same to me. Absolutely. I mean, craziness. Yeah. But I want to bring up some other stories and actually ask you, Raisa, what oh, sure. was happening. But let's go to this one because I was just about to queue this up and it's great that you came over for it. Um, this one's interesting. We talked about this today, uh, and I know, yeah, we made a story. Let's go double screen. Guys, this is a bumper sticker on a, on a truck in Texas, uh, mm -hmm. in the Houston area. And essentially, you can see it. You can read it for yourself. We, get, we bleeped it out. <laughs> yeah. But there, there are articles all over on this. It is, this is sparking a big debate. This is a profane, obviously, anti-Trump sticker sparking a debate in Texas um, about free speech. Because mm -hmm. this was is plastered, is pasted on this person's pickup truck. Um, and what happened was the Texas sheriff actually threatened to bring disorderly conduct charges against the truck for displaying it. Now, it's interesting, and people are, and the ACLU came out in Texas and said, um, hey, you can't prosecute speech because it contains the word, the, the F word, yeah, the mm -hmm. F bomb, um, and the owner should contact ACLU Texas. So there's a debate now sparking uh, whether he should be pursuing charges uh, with freedom of speech and whatnot after the 1971 U.S. Supreme Court case um, mm -hmm. that had to do with an expletive as part of an effort to protest the military. So there's a lot of stuff coming out and there's yeah. a lot of history behind it. But I don't know. I mean, do you guys have thoughts on that? The sheriff came forward and was like, hey, this is bothering people. It's, uh -huh. it's disorderly conduct. I mean, you'd have to see the fine item stuff. But to me, this is immediately free speech is free speech. Free speech is free speech. So we that's sort of what I every think. Every day I feel on the internet, every day. Oh, that people are just saying whatever they oh, want. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, all the so, blogs, you know, everything. Exactly. And I mean, people do get offended and it, people do like to chime in and yeah. either go along with it right. or then express how they feel. This, I feel, is it any different is my question. Mm, than what we see on the internet all the time. Than what we see on the internet all and, the time. And yeah. maybe here on TV too. Because mm -hmm. more recently, and 
it kind of like shook me a little bit the first time I heard it when um, I can't remember what I was watching, but it was definitely a TV show and they dropped the F-bomb and I was like, whoa, mm. when did they start saying that on TV? I mean, I didn't get offended. It just shocked me to mm -hmm. hear that because growing up, the B word, the F word, even the S word were not you know, communicated right. on TV that's, uh, what is it? Um, not not uh, not like HBO, but um, what am I trying Normal to say? Normal or network Exa television? There we go, yeah. network television. Couldn't think of the wording. Yeah, well, it, interestingly, in this case, they apparently they received numerous calls mm -hmm. from people saying, hey, this is an offensive display. I'm yeah. offended by this. Um, I want to discuss, you know, that, that I'm uh, offended and uh, anyway there were there were calls saying it was a display that mm -hmm. didn't rub them the right way and so it's interesting um, I haven't seen anything like this this type mm -hmm. of backlash in a long time I mean this is free speech is a, is a main thing we don't right. see people sort of contest that but Benji saying I think the police were in a bad mood yeah I mean apparently they get a lot of calls so obviously it created an uproar Absolutely. Um, and, and it will I mean I see I will say this I see that spray painted all over DC um, in the U Street area in DC right now. Yep. I live in that area, I walk up and down. I see it all over. I mean, yeah. I see a lot of things that, that are offensive words in my face all the time. Yeah. I try to just be my own person and, exactly. and do my thing, but like yeah, person. you know, anyway. So anyway, a social story sparking a debate. Mm -hmm. Let us know what you think. And then, yeah, we're gonna talk a little more about social media stories. And I have one of them queued up. Uh, Rice, oh. you just worked on this. Oh. Yes, my right? baby. Right? This is too cute. Let me show the video. All right, hang on. <laughs> Give us a little preemptive what this was. Okay, so Let's essentially, it just highlights on the beauty of sibling love. Okay. I have a little brother, and after watching this video that Molly's going to show Heads you, up. It's, yeah. going back. it's going to make me want to go home and hug the stuffing out of him. Aww. Even if he doesn't want it, that's okay. He's going to get it. So basically, you have a little sister who waits for her little brother mm -hmm. at the bus stop every day. But get this. Not just... Is she waiting there for him all excited? She drowns him and him too with love and hugs and kisses and it's just beautiful. And the cool thing is this one did really well in our sort of social world. Yes, it people, did well on Instagram. We posted it yesterday. People love this one. All right, here it is. Oh my Check gosh. out this video. Is there sound? You yeah, added music. a little sound. I had a little music. All right, so making the rounds, doing really well virally. This is too waiting, cute. Up and down. Where and did this, they go? Where was this? So this is actually um, in Philadelphia. Mm. And she, she just grabbed by him. Yeah. And so he just grabbed her. And they're like, oh my gosh, yay. <laughs> oh. And then they go home hand in hand telling each other that they're each other's favorite people on planet Earth. It is the sweetest and cutest, and she's so pure. I love it. And the story you know because you talked to the mother, so right, I of these two children? I got in contact with the mother because we needed permission to use the video, right. um, the whole little, little legal process behind that. And then, um, you know what? We got some balloons well in the Instagram. office, guys. Oh, Check balloons, yes. Happy Thanksgiving, it. everybody. And so, um, yeah, so I got in contact yeah. with her, and I basically thanked her for allowing us to share the video. Yep. And it did so well on our Instagram. I that I had to immediately write a story on it. So she gave me a little detail and um, basically broke down their ages. I love it. And how close of a bond they have and always have had. They were each other's first friends. And most mm. recently, he just started kindergarten this year and they were in the same um, daycare together. So him starting kindergarten, just kind of separated them. And uh, as they say, distance makes the heart grow fonder. So. They've been uh, sharing these adorable little moments every time the school bus stops them off. So. Oh, Yardley, Pennsylvania. Yeah, I'm yes. familiar with that. Cool. I, I know that area. Yeah, Philly yes. area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So a cool yeah. little social story that you've been kind of working on today. Yes. Anything else that was been big um, today? What else? Did you show them dancing cop? I did at the beginning. Oh, God, the we, can, cop, the I, we, we can find it again. We might as well replay it because I, okay. I briefly went through it. Um, let me see if I can have it up. I know it's a little tricky with my stuff here. You yeah. guys saw I literally flipped around my camera and they saw my screens. Hilarious. And they were like, this would be fun to play with. But yeah, it is. It's a lot of screens in my face. OK. But yeah, you do. I know. If you guys were to see, see the setup. Bit. Well, I know. they, do they see kind the of saw it. Snapchat and IG. Right, they kind of saw it. Uh, I'll see if I can find it. Okay. But meanwhile, we were talking earlier to Kim K making ten million in a day for dropping her perfumes. In her perfume, Dang. yeah. Insane. Money. And I think it's like a few. It's not just one. It's like three. It's like three. Mm -hmm. 
beautiful setup. I love how it's like in that quartz bottle. Oh, um, I, I think I saw the picture, but I don't know if so I pretty. brought it out. Yeah, so it looks like it's a it's in a quartz bottle, and um, do you know what the scent is? There were, it was like gardenia, gardenia. Um, okay. gardenia, crystal gardenia, and a citrus gardenia, so something floral. Okay. I guess, I, I'm assuming. Yeah, 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 I would think so too. But the funniest part, I think, of that story is that no one smelled it. They just ordered it. Was it was just like... Celebrity name. Oh, quickly, guys. President Trump is arriving at the Capitol. Let's flash over there really briefly. Not a ton, just sort of a video. It's a live look inside the Capitol. We were waiting on that as we go there. You don't want to mix up the politics and the uh, the social, but there he is. But um, yeah, we were talking also about President Trump's tweets because they've been crazy also today um, with mm-hmm. talking about the uh, basketball players who shoplifted that he helped extradate yeah. extra date out of China essentially uh-huh. and get off back to LA so I remember coming across a few um, social chatter on that and essentially the thing was are they gonna say thank you to the president yeah there was some social chatter about that and we kind of chatted about that earlier on the stream uh-huh. um, they apparently some people are saying hey he didn't give enough time for them to to say a thank you other and then President Trump tweeted that they should have Others are saying, no, man, like President Trump helped them out. Yeah. yeah, like they bet that should have been the first thing they did. Even some chatter in our newsroom about that, Justin and some of the other people uh-huh. felt strongly about it. So it's sort of a debatable thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, is that the first thing they would have thought? Maybe should they have been, or are they just sort of traumatized and trying to figure out right. what's up and then be like, okay, this is how this all happened? Like mentally trying to get it together. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I don't know. It's interesting. Definitely some social chatter on it. Trying to place myself in that position and trying to place my mom in the background. I'm pretty sure the thank you would have been the first thing that would have came to mind. Mm-hmm. Because you're like, oh my gosh, me, thank you for getting me out of the situation. Thank you, God, for getting me out of the situation. So then that would follow with the thank you. But you know what? Everybody's different. Back to, you know, the mentally just trying to get back into the zone. Like, okay, this just literally happened to mm-hmm. us. So. It's it's pretty debatable. Mm-hmm. What are, what are your thoughts? Um, I I keep kind of go either way. I'm kind of neutral yeah. on it. Mm-hmm. I think it, it's a scary situation no matter what. Cause it's China. Oh, gosh, yeah. It's China. I think obviously they did the thing. They did something wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, of course. To they are, but they are Americans first and foremost. So yeah. to, that's he's gonna be on it to get them back. Right. Um, and I don't know. I don't know if. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it should be a big debate, like, oh, yeah. they didn't say thank you. I, I don't think I'm it as really passionate about it, be. but mm-hmm. that's just my just thought. Just like, you know, in chatter. And guys, okay, so you're seeing here, live look outside of the Capitol, a little bit of action, so we make sure we grab that live video mm-hmm. for you, but um, I want to show you, is this going to be, yeah, oh, wait, this is a cool video that our Orlando station put together. Um, this is totally, totally different, changing gears. Venice wow. seeing they're saying it's unusual but I will say this high water is a thing in Venice I actually studied abroad there and they call it aqua alta so high water mm-hmm. and you actually have to use those risers to walk um, in Venice Italy in northern Italy okay. during certain season they go through this high water sort of season and you, it looks like that you wear your wellies you wear your boots and in, in cafes in St. Mark's Square which is what you're looking at are uh, flooded with water and so anyway just pretty interesting to see that they're saying it's unusual because Venice is, they're saying it's slowly sinking and that people need to That's, know yeah. that and get there soon to visit. Um, I have because the water is yet. rising, it's so beautiful and so romantic. I've heard, oh my gosh, it's definitely on my bucket list. Anybody been to Italy? Anybody been to Venice specifically or Italy in general? I'm trying to go back to, but I will say mm-hmm. it has a very special place in my heart because I studied there mm-hmm. and um, it's like I said, it goes through, it's, it's known, we mm-hmm. learned all about it when we were there, mm-hmm. for going through that season of, you know, you have to be prepared for that, the water. Okay. So, pretty interesting. That's nice. When, was, um, when were you there? I was there in, way back in 2006, okay. in fall of 2006. Oh, Actually, magical. yeah, way back in the fall. Um, okay. Gorgeous time to be in. Was uh, it your junior year? It was my junior year. Oh my yeah, gosh, that's fun. awesome. Yeah, wait, let me see what people are saying. Are you guys still on? Yeah, China has some harsh laws. UCLA kids are lucky. That's what you guys think. Um, Trump pardoning the turkey. Sorry, I'm going back to some of the comments. No, yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking of turkey, we have some turkey, I think, in our newsroom today. We have today. some fried turkey, too. Oh, it is. That's it's right. Fried. Do you guys fry, deep fry? Yeah, like, sort of a southern tradition? Oven. I don't know. Sort of more of a southern I, thing. We, I grew up more normal, like, 
crispy oven. Like in the oven, mm -hmm. oh, fried. Sorry, can't do the oven. We did though growing up and then my dad discovered the deep fryer and it's been that since. Mm -hmm. um, I know we're totally switching around. My thought right. processes everywhere. <laughs> Food is happening in our newsroom, so we're like thinking about that. But no, to go back to the seriousness of the Trump thing, I was also, Pete, I was also going to bring up the auto warm beer thing. The, the kid who came back and was in a coma after being in North oh, Korea gosh, yes, I and this. vandalizing or stealing that sign. Mm -hmm. People are comparing that. However, is you know, is it apples and oranges to, to compare North Korea and China? It's I mean, different jurisdictions. it's similarly, but, similar yeah. but different. But um, it, it, it definitely is something that I was thinking about when comparing, you know, a, a, a petty fair. crime essentially committed in this foreign this communist country, and then being coming back and um, mm -hmm. and being okay. I'm, these the kids. I also agree. I think it's it's great that they're back and, and free and not mm -hmm. injured and everything is okay. Absolutely. But things could have been worse, probably. Uh -huh. um, Iran saying deep frying deep frying turkeys is the number one cause of house fires in November. I wonder if that's true. Interesting. Um, <laughs> Is it? I would think so because I have come across so a dangerous. lot of articles. Exactly. It's dangerous. My dad used to be a chef, Iran. That's right. So uh, he's got it down packed. That's right. Awesome. You guys are getting me talking about food and making me yes. hungry now. Definitely getting ready for that. Um, okay. We were going to find that other video. And if I can find it, I know it was on here. The, oh, we talked about <gasps> it. Sorry. I know. She just pulled across Dogs. the dog. Oh, my gosh. So many cuteness. So much cuteness. Looking for viral stuff. What else was going viral this morning? What else is going mine? on? I'll find the dancing. Think. Let's see. Um, what else was going on? See, when you put me on the hot side, I know, it's hard. I'm we, like, oh, blah, blah, blah. I'm thinking about so many things right now. We are yeah. one week to Thanksgiving, so that's literally a I week away. Believe. Are you doing any shopping? Um, I did my shopping yesterday. For food, you mean? No. For like holidays. For stuff, for holiday stuff. Because I think Thanksgiving and then I think Black Friday. Yeah. And I feel like now it's like Cyber Monday, which is like the bigger thing because I don't go out shopping online on Black Everything's online now. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not really focused on it. I think I'm yeah. going to be uh, in the around here in the area okay. so I'll be around with friends oh, um nice. but um okay yeah you guys here's the clip from let me just play this quickly it's like a quick 20 second Mark clip Olivia, yeah oh the president God. Trump thing with the water check it out oh wait let me see if I can get it up uh. from yesterday mm-hmm they don't have water that's okay what? No, it's okay. Oh. So people saying this was like the awkward moment where he kind of got off mic, showed the bottle, but was Japanese given this Fiji water bottle. Toyota and Mazda. <laughs> Don't you love how so people resurrected his tweet from 2013, though? They did, and the <sighs> people are doing that. Well, we were just talking about that, the Marco constantly. Rubio thing. Yeah. yeah. People are constantly finding these old tweets to kind of be like, there it is again. Yeah. So to be like, well, you said this back then, then this and that. And, and now you're doing exactly what you said was mm -hmm. an issue. I mean, that's social media for you. They never forget. We don't forget. <laughs> social that's media funny. never forgets. All right, yeah. that was President Trump. That was from yesterday. I heard the newsroom sort of laugh about it as it was happening, and it yeah. was like later in the afternoon. I was like, wait, what just happened yeah. on, with the water? So we po I posted it on our Instagram oh, you did. stories because oh, I did. immediately saw that, and then I yeah. saw people retweeting the 2013 tweet and I was like okay we need to correlate the two mm -hmm. because thank you social media oh my gosh so funny um well you guys saw the dancing cop earlier we we played it out for you yeah. but it was funny from from Texas kind Justice of, League this week oh yeah I'm excited I'm going Saturday guys you are going are you we should have had you on we missed you yesterday we had um Kevin McCarthy was chatting a little bit about it he gave his review yeah um and they were he and Chris were talking about if it was worth going and wh what about the movie so we're gonna have to hear your review next yeah, week I'll let you guys know because I wasn't too into it only because I'm not a fan of Ben Affleck I'm so sorry I don't like him as Batman that's just me and we'll end that there but I <laughs> am going for Wonder Woman Gail I'm going for you girl oh she's amazing supporting her um, but, um I'm sure it'll be great what yeah, I don't have my tickets yet, but I do want to see it, especially mm -hmm. after their little chatter about it. Okay, I didn't, I didn't and hear it, but I like to read Kevin's reviews after I, know. I see my movie. His are so thorough I'm like, okay, and long that's too. It. He's totally right. So thorough, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I um, it's on our website. His review officially, but mm -hmm. um, yesterday it was super fun to have him on. We're gonna have him on more because I like to talk about the movies. Yeah. Um, you guys are chattering still about the water and 
Trump. Yeah, it's causing like a lot of chatter. I don't really, I don't know. I don't yeah. see the draw really to like how crazy it was. But yeah, it was. Um, a, yeah. <laughs> also tonight, Rice and I are going to a cool, another cool digital installation. We're gonna yeah. have coverage of that for you tomorrow. Some cool pictures and videos, and um, that'll be a fun one. So surprise, it'll be. It's kind of sports related. Sports related. I'm wearing sports clothes, but mm -hmm. it looks like it's work. Clothes. Oh yeah, you are. You're doing yeah, a good job with that. It just doesn't look like it. We have the tennis shoes and the clock. So we're gonna go. Yeah. So we're gonna go cover that together mm -hmm. today after work, and I have fun. some cool uh, coverage and video for you tomorrow. Absolutely. Um, for more social. Yeah, Kevin is a super good movie critic. We love talking to him. Oh he's gosh, so he's entertaining. So awesome. He's so vibrant and awesome. And he gets to all these cool trips yeah. across the world, across the country for his oh, Hollywood so in the know. Um, reviews. Yeah. I always go to him. I always, I like asking him, like, give me a little bit of juice before I go visit a movie, before I go see a movie, excuse mm -hmm. me. And he gives me just enough. And when I'm in that movie, I'm like, yep, that is totally right. So Kevin. you can look for a certain yeah. thing or like, know what he's talking about. Exactly. And know his reference. Because he's so passionate mm -hmm. about it. And I love it. I love, I yeah. love hearing reviews from Kevin. It's super fun to watch him. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that's what we got for viral videos. Yeah. Kind of talk, talked about the, ran the gamut of stuff that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so we're gonna go over to inside, I think the Senate chambers guys, uh, Senate, uh, Nancy Pelosi is speaking and um, it's sort of, I think it's part of her weekly address, but it is important because today, like we were, we were saying, the House votes on tax reform. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the big thing of, of Congress, Capitol Hill today. Yeah. So we'll go over inside more politics and then uh, see where the day brings us. Right, Thanks for chatting, right. Raisa. Thank you for having me. And we'll see you again soon, tomorrow, if tomorrow not wish. Friday, yeah. Yes. All, right, All right, girl. All right, guys, bye. All right, guys, over to Capitol Hill. Financial contributions will stop if this tax scam fails. Well, he didn't say scam. I'm saying scam, that's my word. Back to the book, the Pope and the Catholic bishops. The US Conference of Catholic Bishops wrote, this proposal appears to be the first federal income tax modification in American history that will raise income taxes on the working poor while simultaneously providing a large tax cut to the wealthy. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops went on to say, this is simply unconscionable. My colleagues, we always begin our session with prayer, and many of us attend Mass on the weekend on Sundays. But we cannot pray and think that that gives us a lesson to pray on people the rest of the week. And that is what this bill does. It preys on the middle class and those aspire to it. It pillages and loots the middle class. It is a shameful piece of legislation and the Republicans should know better. They say it's gonna get better in the Senate. Oh my gosh, in the Senate, as, as Mr. Hoyer pointed out, major, uh, unanimously the Senate Finance Committee rejected this proposal already. Was it 26 to zero, whatever the number was, the zero loomed large. But getting back to values, because that's what we're here to do and what we do in our budget, which is uh, uh, the tax bill is a part of, it's supposed to be a statement of values. In his study of civilization, the great British historian Arnold Toynbee found at the beginning of a hopeful country, the political leadership formed a creative minority that inspired and led the flowering of civilization. But in some nations, leaders became a dominant minority of exploiters focused on their own wealth and power. Arnold Toynbee, welcome to the Republican side of the aisle in Congress. These competing mindsets, he went on, between the dominant minority of exploiters versus the creative minority that inspired and led the flowering of civilization, these competing mindsets and motivations create schisms in a body social and schisms in the soul of the body politic. And lo and behold, the Republican Party has written a bill. Nearly half the benefits go to the top 1% top 1% in our country, and 80% of the benefits go to the top 2%. This is a, moment, a defining moment, but it's also a moment of truth. How can the Republicans with a straight face say to the middle class, well, we're doubling this or doubling that, give with one hand, 
take with another. And to hear them cheer, hear them cheer for the, uh, the provision in here about the estate tax, listen to this. You tell me if you think this is fair. 1,800 families in America, not your family farmer, that everybody's taken care of in what we have done already with the estate tax. In this bill, 1,800 of the wealthiest families, the filers in our country, will, in the life of the bill, get the break of $172 billion. 1,800 families. This is for 1,800 families. And you know what? The Republicans cheered that. 1,800 families are going to get $172 billion. They cheer the fact that uh, 1 .5, up to $1.5 trillion in tax cuts goes to corporate America, while at the same time giving them another tax break to send jobs overseas, at the same time absolving them of any responsibility when it comes to state and local uh, uh, taxes, while insisting that individuals pay the state and local, lose the state and local tax deduction, but corporations do not. And listen to all of it. Were they cheering when they're saying to a teacher? Here they're cheering when they say to a teacher, you may bring supplies to your school because your school and classes need that. God bless you for that. But we're taking away your tax, uh, the tax deduction that goes with that. What? Is that something to cheer about? They're saying to students who get a $2,500 tax De uh, deduction on uh, interest on student loans. Forget about that. Even though it may make the difference between your attending college or not, forget about that. We're too busy giving a tax cut to the 1,800 wealthiest families in America so they can get $172 billion in tax breaks over the next 10 years. They're saying to families, whether they have a child with a disability, a senior with Alzheimer's, and everything in between. If you have extraordinary medical expenses, and since 1944, you have been able to deduct them, no more, no more, because we got to give it to the high end. So take that away. Do you have any idea what that means to America's working families and what it means for them if they have Alzheimer's? We had one person come to our event in San Francisco last week from Barbara Lee's district, she said it cost almost a, 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 over $170,000 in cost for her because her husband has Alzheimer's. The tax deduction enabled them, enabled them to survive. She said, I can't even imagine the cruelty that decided that this should happen in this tax bill. So understand what this means in people's lives and tell the truth about it. Tell the truth about it. Republicans want you to believe that their trickle-down tax break for the rich will pay for itself. Never has happened. Never has happened. As Bruce Bartlett, Bruce Bartlett architect of Jack Cum Supply Side Economics said, it's not true that this trickle-down economics pays for itself. It's not true. It's nonsense. And he went on to say, it was BS in the full extent of those words. This tax scam won't create jobs. It won't raise wages. It will only fill the coffers of the donors and the fat cats. The GOP tax scam will add trillions to the debt and stick our children with a bill that you cannot pay off. And we, none of us will probably be around by the time the full comp, uh, uh, impact of the hemorrhaging of the debt in the second 20, uh, 10 years of this bill will require big tax increases. Look to the Kansas example. The gentleman is correct. The House will come to order. I thank the gentleman. The gentlelady will still continue to pause. Maybe I'll have the to use my mother of five voice so that she will listen. The gentlelady will continue to pause. The member has made a valid point, and the chair will get the House in order before the gentlelady continues. As I always like General to say, lady will now caucus, continue. Mr. Speaker, maybe I have to use my mother of five voice uh, to be heard. 
But as a mother of five and a grandmother of nine. A little bit of contention there, guys, on the uh, floor of the house, but it's kind of a cool inside look at what's going on uh, there with Nancy Pelosi. So this is live. Um, I'll have some more information for you guys on some of the art stuff and the museum stuff that you're talking about because I have a lot of thoughts on some of your comments. But let's listen in to what she has to say here. Policy making here, but getting back to this. The tax scam won't create jobs. It won't raise wages, as I said. It will only fill the coffers of donors and the fat cats. The GOP tax scam will add trillions to the debt. Oh, where, oh, where are the deficit hawks? Have you become extinct? Have you become, is there not one among you who understands what this does to the national debt? And with all due respect to your leader, for him to put at our doorstep the debt when it was a creation, President Bush went into office on a path from President Clinton of deficit reduction. The last five Clinton budgets were in balance or in surplus. President Bush turned that around by re in, uh, uh, repealing pay-as-you-go, tax cuts for the wealthy, didn't trickle down, two unpaid fair wars, give away to pharma, the pharmaceutical industry, taking us uh, to a place Remember September of 2008, when we were in the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. But anyway, back to here. Uh, as Republicans know, our Republican friends have already shown us their playbook. In this bill, corporations will get a cut of $1.5 trillion, the same $1.5 trillion that Republicans plan to slash from Medicare and Medicaid in the GOP budget. In their bones, the American people know they're getting a raw deal under the Republican bill before us. You know it. You know it. You know why you're here. You know what you're doing. Democrats believe the American people deserve better, a better deal, better jobs, better wages, better future. We want to pay, create good paying jobs, raise workers' rate, wages, lower the cost of living for families, give Americans the tools they need to succeed in the 21st century. But you can't do that if you have a budget that does not invest in that future and is hampered by the uh, cuts. Let's go back to the drawing board. Let's write a bipartisan bill that raises wages, creates jobs, promotes growth, reduces the deficit. But to get to that place, we would want to go to the table in a bipartisan way. What are you afraid of? In a bipartisan way uh, to put together a, a tax bill that is good for the American people instead of one that does violence to the American dream. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to vote no and to demand a better bill for America's working families. And I want to return to U.S. Conference of uh, Catholic Bishops to put their fabulous statement about this uh, tax bill in the record. And I, re I return to their, one of their statements. This proposal appears to be the first federal income tax modification in American history that will raise income taxes on the working poor while simultaneously providing a large tax cut for the wealthy. And the Senate is not going to make it better. They have already said they're raising taxes on the, those making under $75,000 and giving tax cuts to the wealthy. They've already said they're going to take ta affordable care away from 13 million Americans. I don't know how that's making it better. That might be something you applaud, but I certainly hope you would not vote for it. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back. The chair would remind all speakers to direct their time reps to the, to the chair and not in second, or next, in second person. The gentleman from Texas is now recognized. Mr. Speaker, no one man has plowed the field for tax reform for more years, uh, more boldly, or more effectively than the gentleman from Wisconsin. I'm pleased and proud to yield one minute to the Speaker of the House, Mr. Ryan. All right, guys, so this stream is about to switch out, actually, and we're going to go over, hopefully if it switches in a second, to Los Angeles, uh, where Leanne Tweeden, again, the radio host who has accused uh, Senator Al Franken of groping her in 2006, is apparently going to be speaking or something's going to come up with her. So there she is. All right, so we're going to go over there. In the entertainment business or anybody in Hollywood or what have you have a... They have something that they like to put their time and their efforts into, right? Or 
Um, mine just happens to be, um, uh, I like to support the troops. You know, my father served in Vietnam. My husband's uh, in the Air Force. He's a pilot. And uh, my dad was in Vietnam when he was a young man. He was a, a teenager when he got the draft notice. And he had a, a USO tour um, with Bob Hope and Raquel Welch when he was in, in Vietnam. And so I heard the story, you know, when I was a young girl and I always thought, wow, that's really cool. So uh, when I first came up in the entertainment business and um, I was first asked if I would like to go do a USO tour, I thought, oh man, that'd be really cool. You know, and sort of pick up that mantle and be like, maybe I could be somebody's Raquel Welch, you know. And so I started doing USO tours and, and visiting wounded warriors and, and doing all of that. And of course, that co sort of corresponded with, um, you know, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And um, I started doing that. And, and so by the time 2006 came around, um, I was on my ninth USO tour. So uh, eight tours going into the Middle East. And this particular tour, we were traveling with the Sergeant Major of the Army and the USO. And, uh, excuse me, let me get some water. And, uh, Al Franken was on our tour. And then we had some uh, country music artists and a couple of Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. And we kind of do a, it's like a variety show. And because I, you know, I don't sing or dance, I'm a host. So I MC the shows and you sort of introduce all the, the acts. Um, I go out there and I talk about my experiences and why I'm there and you know um, my past tours and why I'm thankful and my dad had you know a USO show and um, that particular year since there was Al Franken too and he doesn't sing or dance, uh, he sort of co, co MC'd the show. But because he was a, a comedian and actor and a writer, and people knew him from SNL. He came and wrote some skits, and he would do skits in between some of the acts. And um, I'd never met him before, but uh, he had come. You know, we all knew who we were going on tour with beforehand, let's say that. So I'd never met him before. We met up in DC to, to travel over for this tour. He had written a script, um, a little skit, I guess, if you will, uh, with me in mind. And so when we uh, met up, he's like, hey, so I've written a little script. If you, if you want to do it with me, we can, you know, you want to play along. So I was like, yeah, sure, okay, that's fine. And uh, so when I finally got the script a couple days into it, you know, it's was, it was a typical, you know, if you think about it, our military is comprised mostly of young, very young, um, early 20s males. Uh, and he, wrote this very, um, you know, tongue-in-cheek, very, uh, it's full of sexual innuendos, you know, um, you know, probably a two-minute long skit. I don't even remember all those details. It was just, you can see some of the, you can find some video online, you know, everything was very, very tongue-in-cheek, very, every, you know, I'd say a line and he'd say a line and it was all, you know, mm -hmm, double entendres and stuff like that. And there was a scene where he would kiss me. But of course, you know, I mean, in his mind, I'm sure he was going to kiss me. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, he's never going to kiss me. Um, and uh, so that was that. Well, before we got to the first uh, show, because a couple days in country, you, you just meet people. And then we, we have the first show in Kuwait is where we were for the first show. Um, we had a little backstage area. And they had it sort of cordoned off. And um, we were backstage alone because he's like, okay, we're gonna get ready. And then they sort of introduce us. We come through a, a little backstage door and then we um, open up into the crowd on the stage. And the backstage area was actually part of the gym because that's just sort of how these makeshift places are on these bases. So this little gym, we had this one little corner kind of like this with these little curtains and they just sort of cordoned off this little area. So it was just me and Al backstage and he had his little props for the rest of his show. Um, for the rest of his little skits by himself. And uh, he's like, well, we need to practice the kissing scene. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. And I just sort of blew him off because I didn't, like, we don't need to practice the kissing scene. It's just a quick little thing, you know? And then he 
persisted, and he's like, no, we really need to practice the kissing scene, and okay, Al, you just turn your head right, I'll turn my head right, we got this, you know, whatever. And he kept persisting, and I'm like, Al, this isn't SNL, we, we're not really going to kiss, so we don't really have to practice. And he just kept persisting, and it just reminded me of like the Harvey Weinstein tape that you heard the girl when she was wired up for the New York, um, the NYPD, and he just persistent and badgering and just relentless, you know? And so I was just like, okay, fine, just so he would shut up, you know? And he just sort of came at me, and he, we did the line, and he came at me, and before you even know it, I mean, you kind of get close, and he just put his hand on the back of my head, and he mashed his face against, I mean, it happened so fast, and he just mashed his, his lips against my face, and he stuck his tongue in my mouth so fast. And all I can remember is that his lips were really wet and it was slimy. And in my mind, I called him fish lips the rest of the trip because that's just what it reminded me of. I don't know why. And he stuck his tongue down my, my mouth. And I remember I pushed him off with my hands. And I just remember I almost punched him. So, cause every time I see him now, like my hands clench into fists and I'm sure that's probably why. And I said, if you ever do that to me again, I'm not going to be so nice about it the second time. And I just walked out away from him and I, and I walked out and I just wanted to find a bathroom and I just wanted to rinse my mouth out because I was just disgusted. You know, it was just one of those, um, I don't know, I, I was violated. I just felt like, you know, he betrayed my trust and it, obviously that is not what I wanted and that's I felt like he wrote that just to get that piece in because he knew he wasn't going to get it on stage and that was that was why he was badgering me to do it then when we were alone because that's what he wanted and then you know five minutes later we had to go out on stage and I always joke I'm I've always been I, I've never been an actress so people always think when you're in Hollywood I was a model and then I was a television host and and People are like, oh, you're an actress. I've never been an actress. That's a whole different set of talent, and, and I, I, I don't act. And I had to be an actress. You know, I had to go out on stage with this guy who just did this to me five minutes before and act like he's my best friend and Al Franken, ladies and gentlemen, and this is the greatest thing ever, and do our lines. And, and trust me, he didn't even get close to my face when we had to come in for the kissing scene. And... It's it's funny because when this whole Harvey Weinstein thing came out in the last like two weeks when I was deciding, is this the time I tell my story? And I was just lo looking online and trying to find videos and, t you know, recalling everything that happened in my mind from, from this time 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And I found a blog of a soldier who was at one of our shows in Afghanistan or, or Iraq, and he he just talks about his experience at the show just as a, a guy in the audience. And he said, you know, Al Franken and Leanne Tweeden were great co MCs, and Al told a couple of jokes. And then, then Al goes in for a kiss or more from Leanne and fails. And I just thought, yeah, that's exactly what happens. And he failed every time because that's what happens on stage. And, you know, I thought is it, it would be, um, the joke would always have been to me, the funny part was, it would have been like Al would have, you know, in my mind, Al would have just come in for a kiss and I would have turned my face or I would have put my hand on his mouth. And that would have been the funny part, right? That would have been like this old guy coming in for the kiss from the hot girl or whatever, you know, the skit would have been to these young troops and it would have been funny because it was comedy, right? Obviously it turned out completely different, but you know, so I had to act my way through the rest of the shows for the next two weeks, 10 days, two weeks. Um, and I just made sure I was never alone with him again. I never told, I didn't tell the Sergeant Major of the Army what happened. I didn't tell our USO rep kids, what was I going to do? Be the troublemaker, be like, okay, I'm going to MC every part of the show for the hour, except the 10 minutes I'm on stage with Al, you know, I just sucked it up. I'm a strong girl. I'm a sportscaster. So I deal with guys every day. I'm just going to fake it and act like an actress and do this part with him and then not talk to him for the rest of the, you know rest of the tour. I mean, it's a it was a big tour with a lot of people. I just didn't I didn't socialize with him. I didn't talk to him for the rest of the tour. I made sure I was never alone with him again. I mean, we're in tight quarters, but there were a lot of people around, so I just made sure I was never alone with him again, and um, so I didn't have to deal with him in that respect.
again, other than when we were on stage. Uh, and then, you know, little petty things that I had to deal with, just snide comments. Um, we would do autograph sessions after the shows. Uh, of course, they would set up tables. And because there would be sometimes thousands of troops at an event, and we would only have so much time. So there would be long tables for all the, you know, the country music artists and the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders who were very popular, by the way. And then um, instead of like trying to have a single file line of, you know, a thousand guys trying to come down and get everybody's autograph, they would open it up to where you, everybody, if you wanted somebody's certain autograph and there was only time for people to wait in one line, they would just open it up to where people could just stand in the line that they would want instead of filing it through like this. So sometimes there would be, honest to God, nobody in Al Franken's line. So people would line up, the girls would have long lines, some of the country music artist guys would have long lines. So I would always be sat next to Al because that's just how they always set it up. And so I would always sort of have my back to him and whatever, and I'd be sitting next to the other people. And we'd have lines, we would sign autographs, and I mean, it was just hours of signing and taking pictures with troops. And one time he didn't have people in his line, and I would see things out of the corner of my eye, and I'd see, you know, like a hand and a picture, one of my autograph pictures go like this, and, you know, and I would look over one time, and, you know, one time I would just see, and a picture would come back, and it would be, you know, my face with devil horns and the, the, the devil tail and the pitchfork and the goatee and you know I mean these are the things I'm dealing with right like he draws me as the devil I'm like okay childish belittling whatever it's just like <laughs> that's uh, two weeks of this is what I'm getting at sorry and uh, so whatever so I make it through the the two weeks of that and then um, we're on our way home we leave, uh, pretty sure it's Bagram Air Base, we're leaving out of Afghanistan. And every time you take off from a, um, from a base when you're in the middle of combat, you always wear a Kevlar helmet uh, and, a, and a flag vest. Um, because when you leave from a, um, in the middle of a war zone, you do wear your, your, your gear because small arms fire or even an RPG like a rocket propelled grenade can, can pierce the armor uh, or pierce the the skin of an airplane and so a lot of times you either sit on Kevlar or you, you wear it because you can be shot at through a plane. So you're wearing it as you take off until you get high enough altitude where you're out of that reach and then you can take it off. So I'm wearing it, I fall asleep because I can fall asleep usually before the plane even takes off. So I'm sleeping up against the side of the plane um, and in the photo, if you see the photo, beside me is Mark Wills, a country singer. He's also asleep. Um, so I'm sleeping which anybody that knows me, I sleep anywhere, anytime, so I'm asleep. Uh, and uh, there are photographers on the trip, and I'm pretty sure it was probably the photographer of the tour that took the picture, but they give you CDs as you leave that have, you know, behind the scenes photos of you on the entire tour that they give you when you leave. And uh, I get this and I open it up when I get home. Um, I probably opened it the next day, and it was a photo of Al doing his, you know, this on my breast, like looking at the camera, just kind of smirking and smiling, like, hey, look at me. And I took that as the, you know, the final, like, <laughs> like I got the last laugh, um, you know. I mean, he knew I wouldn't see it until until I got home and, you know, was away from everybody else and, and uh, you know, like I said, the, the, to know it in the context of the entire trip and what, what happened in the entire two weeks um, is, is telling to me. And, and just the, the fact that um, he just thought he could get away with it and that it was okay and that it was funny. And, you know, I knew... I knew all these years later that, oh, well, I thought it was going to be funny. You know, I thought, you know, oh, the comedian, I thought it was going to be a, I thought it was a joke. I was in bad taste or I thought it was going to be funny and I guess it wasn't or, you know, it was poor taste or whatever. I mean, nothing like that is ever funny. I mean, is it funny if, if he does that to your sister or your daughter or your wife? I mean, that that's just, 
all of those things. But like I said, in context of already assaulting me backstage and, and every, all the little petty things he was doing to belittle me and, and, and how he treated me and sort of, you know, in succession. And then it ended with that. And then how I was left to feel like without being able to say whatever I needed to say to his face, that that's how I, you know, I'm like, oh, great. While I was sleeping, you do that to me. And then I can't even say anything to him. So that's just sort of how it all happened and how it finished. So when he, when he says in a statement, and he's issued two statements and says, one, I apologize. Mm -hmm. Two, I respect women. Three, I don't remember the schedule. Wait, hold on. So I've only seen the first one. Can you read the second yeah. and third ones uh, to me? Well, he says, I respect women. I don't respect men who don't. The fact that my own actions have given people a good reason to doubt that makes me feel ashamed. Uh, he's also asked for, as has Mitch McConnell, an investigation. So, one, do you accept his apology? And two, what do you think should happen after an investigation? I mean, I, yeah, I, there's no reason why I shouldn't accept his apology. You know, I mean, if that's sure. Um, I. I wasn't, um, I didn't come out to, I wasn't looking for anything, you know what I mean? And people were like, well, what, what were you expecting from him? What did you expect from him? If he wanted to apologize, great. If, if, I mean, look, this has happened, this has been going on for, this happened 11 years ago. I saw him a couple of years after that with my husband at a USO gala, and he walked up to me and found me in a room and said hello to me, and I was very cold to him, and I turned around, he, found me and, and, you know, with my back to him and said hello. And I was like, hi, Al. And I turned around and walked away from him. My husband even said to me last night, he's like, as I recall, Leanne, you left me standing there with Al because you said hello and then turned and turned your back on him and walked away and left me standing there with him. And I'm like, yeah, because I wasn't going to talk to him. You know, so <laughs> my husband said hello, Al. But no, he had a chance to apologize to me then because he knew, he knew exactly what he did to me then. And that picture was out there. So he had a chance to apologize to me. So I wasn't holding my breath. I'd have been long dead by now, by then, you know. So um, the apology, sure, I accept it. Yes, I mean, pe people make mistakes. And of course, he knew he made a mistake. So yes, I do accept that apology. Um, the ethics investigation, if that's what Mitch McConnell wants to do, uh, that's, that's on them. I, I, I'm not calling for that. If that's what he wants to do, I, OK, that's, that's up to them. I, I'm not demanding that. I'm not. I'm not demanding any of that. I, I just don't want this. To me, it's more about, um, you know, this is happening in Hollywood. I think we live in a bubble. I live in a bubble. I've worked in the entertainment business, um, sports, radio, television, commercials, movies for over 20 years. And I think because all of this is happening here, I mean, this has, you know, I mean, with Al now in, in the Senate. So this is. Um, kind of Hollywood and kind of politics, but it's sort of the same sort of stage, you know, it's just sort of parallel. But um, this is happening in middle America. This is happening, you know, for women that work at Chili's. This is happening for women who work in an office building somewhere in Iowa and Kansas and Florida. I mean, this is happening to women who have, have you know, no power and no say to speak up. You know what I mean? And this is, um, I think the tide is turning and, and you know, what, what about all the women who don't have microphones and have a voice and can say something and then it's everywhere on the news? You know, what about the women who get assaulted every day and are afraid to speak out? I mean, look, I was afraid to speak out 11 years ago. I wanted to say something and, and there were people around me who said, oh my God, you will get annihilated and you will never work in this town again. And I was afraid of that. I really was afraid of that. You know, I was working at the Best Damn Sports Show. I was working at Fox Sports. I mean, I, I had a good career, and I thought, you know what, if I, if I come out and speak out then, I probably would get fired or would just get phased out. And, and I was afraid of that, you know, and I'm not afraid of that anymore. I mean, could it still happen? Sure, possibly, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot more secure in, 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 you know, myself, my career at this age now, and I really do think the tide has turned and really, I'm doing it now because it's different. There's strength in numbers. Uh, Congresswoman Jackie um, Spear has come out, and she's talking about it now. And when she said she had that experience when she was in her 20s as a congressional aide and came out and said her chief of staff 
stopped her in an office and, and grabbed her face and kissed her and stuck his tongue in her mouth. And I, I just, we had her on our air. And she said that to us while we were interviewing her on McIntyre in the Morning, the show that I'm the news anchor on. And I said, I looked at Doug and I went, I kind of mouthed them like, that was Al Franken to me. And I said, I think that was my catalyst to sort of go, you know, if I'm going to tell my story, now is the time. 2017 is not 2006. You know, it's just a different time. And maybe, maybe I can be somebody's Jackie Spear and, and they can tell their story in real time and not, not wait and not wait. I mean, why do you think so many people are coming out now that have stories that are decades old? You know, people make mistakes. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not calling for him to step down. <laughs> you know, I, that's not my place to say that. You know, I mean, if there are other people that come out and say he's done this, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, if I'm the only one that's come out and said Senator Franken's done something to me, but if there are other women that have come out, I, you know, I haven't returned a phone call. I've gotten a phone call from a woman that has, I've only gotten a message and that said that some uh, something similar has happened to her and I haven't returned it yet. So um, I'll... That's to be determined, but you know, I don't know. That's not my call. I, I, I don't, I don't know, but I don't, you know, I'm not saying that. You know, Le Leanne's been here since 3.30 this morning. Um, we still need a fast one-on-one. -on -one. We can do it standing up there if we can kind of move it along, but I think this was probably maybe more than anyone thought it was. Unbelievable what you've done. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if we need to do that, let's do it and get going and bring me the mic in. Yes. And we're good to go. Thank you. Yeah, sure. It does. Bring the whole thing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, really interesting stuff, and thank you for commenting along. I'm seeing a lot of you guys talking about this issue, which is, like I said, a developing story. KABC radio host, news anchor, she's also a sportscaster model, uh, Leanne Tweeden, accusing Minnesota Democratic Senator Al Franken of groping her and kissing her back in 2006. So that was her statement. Obviously, I always find it interesting. These people, she's so good at recounting this story because she is a host. She's a radio host. She's a news person. She can talk about it. Um, seeing a varied amount of opinions here, guys. One of you saying, Schultz saying, I think he's more of a practical joker um, than a pervert. That's just what you think. Um, other people don't know. Comedians don't have the right to grab people without their consent. Even if it's a joke, it's not okay. That's what Pete says. Yeah, definitely some varying opinions on the stream on this one. But it is, like I said, it's a developing story. She's hoping more people are going to come out. And we'll see how the senator himself responds. I haven't seen any tweet from him yet or anything. Um, and even this morning when uh, some reporters yelled out to Donald Trump about it, uh, they were like, President Trump, do you have anything to say about Senator Franken or Roy Moore? And he did not answer uh, those um, appeals, those questions from reporters. So interesting stuff. We'll see if he does tweet about that or anything else comes out from uh, there. And we're going to switch it over now to uh, looks like what they just switched it to on that feed, which is outside of the Menendez trial, which is, I believe, locked at a standstill. And they're going to explain that. that. ...handled on its own merits uh, and in its own time. Uh, but it has nothing to do with this case, and it was rightfully kept out of, of this matter. Kirk, could you explain what happened behind the closed doors? We're back here roughly 45 minutes. Oh. Very quickly, the procedure in New Jersey under the rule is that, uh, like the judge said, he would question each juror, and it was really a question about whether they believed that the jury was truly deadlocked, and that's all it was to each juror, whether they, whether the note was their note, whether they agreed with it, and whether they believed the jury was truly deadlocked, and they each answered in the affirmative. Is there any vote? No. Did you get any sense how divided the jury was? No. Uh, the only sense we got is that they all believed that they were not going to be able to reach a unanimous verdict. Do you expect to see a retrial, and if so, when? Uh, I don't expect that, but I don't know. And that's not something that we're in control of. Uh, we still have motions pending where the judge could grant acquittal on different issues, and we'll wait for him to do that. Um, but at, at this time, we would 
uh, hope to move forward and, and keep fighting for Dr. Melgan and, and, and keep going on. So with that, I think uh, that's all the questions. And I know that the senator and his people will be coming out shortly. So thank you very much. Thank you. So the judge has called 12. Yes. So can we get your name? Can we get your name in the mic, please? Uh, Kirk Ogroski. Thank you. Council, just two seconds here, please. We're in live order. Right, the files. After five years of a long and involved investigation and trial that cost the taxpayers millions of dollars, with an army of prosecutors and FBI agents, with over a hundred people interviewed in the United States and other countries, with more than two or three dozen grand jury witnesses, with more than a half a million documents that have been obtained by the government, with over 50 witnesses at a nine-week trial, and with all the rulings that occurred in this court for the last nine weeks, this jury could not, would not, and did not return a verdict that validated any of the government's charges. And at the end of the day, the fundamental reason for that is that this is what happens when you put a real 25-year friendship on trial. <clears throat> well, first and above all, I want to thank God because it is by His grace that I was delivered from an unjust prosecution. I want to thank my children, Alicia, who was here uh, every day with me in court and who brought my lovely granddaughter, Evangelina, to New Jersey so that I could remember what I had to fight on for. My son, Rob, who testified on my behalf and then joined his sister in court, who kept me company and even let me beat him in a round of golf. I'm so blessed to have two great children. And I love you so much, I can't. I can't. <laughs> I can't truly thank you. I want to thank my sister Caridad and her husband Pete. Their presence in the Bible passages my sister would send me every morning were an incredible strength to me. I want to thank the Melgan family, Flora, Melissa, Jesus, for their constant friendship and their faith in our innocence. And I wish my dear friend Sal success in his continuing search for justice. I want to thank my defense team, as well as Dr. Melgan's attorneys, Abby Lowell, the nation's premier defense attorney, who methodically tore apart the government's case. His partner, Jenny Kramer, a former prosecutor turned advocate for justice. Ray Brown, whose insights were invaluable, and his associates, Greg Hilster and uh, Justin Kolbenschlag, who gave their total commitment to our cause. And to Dr. Melgan's defense team, Kirk Orgalski, Murad Hussein, John Kogan, and Sam Stern for their invaluable roles. I want to thank the jury, 12 New Jerseyans, who saw through the government's false claims and used their Jersey common sense to reject it. I appreciate their service. I appreciate their sacrifice and their time away from their family and their professions. 
I want to thank my colleague, Senator Cory Booker, who has been supportive from day one, traveled the state and spread the good word, was here on the first day of trial, and came and testified and was, in my mind, a profile in courage. I know that many who were close to him urged him not to testify, but it's the measure of an incredible man who was willing not only to use his personal reputation, but take a risk in order to see justice done. He is a public servant of unlimited potential who could just easily serve our country in the highest office of all of the land. I'll never forget it, Corey, and you have my gratitude and respect forever. <laughs> I also want to thank Senator Lindsey Graham, my friend and colleague, for once again crossing the aisle and coming to testify as to my character, my truthfulness, and my honesty. And while I know he came as a friend, I appreciate the political capital he used as a Republican to come and testify on behalf of a Democratic colleague. That's rare indeed in today's politics. I want to thank the clergy of all different denominations who stood with me, who strengthened me, and yes, prayed with me. I'm so thankful for your spiritual comfort and support. I want to thank Harry Magro, a leader in the autistic community, Bishop Jackson, Pastor Sambas, my dear friend and Cypriot leader, all for being character witnesses. I want to thank the hundreds of New Jerseyans who I encountered along the last 10 weeks who overwhelmingly expressed their support and more importantly, their prayers. I want to thank my staff, both in D.C. and New Jersey, for their loyalty and, above all, their dedication to the people of New Jersey, especially Fred Turner, my chief of staff, Mike Solomon, my political director, and Mike Ortega, my special assistant. Now, let me say a few things. The way this case started was wrong. The way it was investigated was wrong. The way it was prosecuted was wrong, and the way it was tried was wrong as well. Certain elements of the FBI and of our state cannot understand or even worse accept that the Latino kid from Union City and Hudson County can grow up to be a United States Senator and be honest. I can't even begin to tell you how many people have come to tell me that the FBI went to them and asked them, what can you give us on Menendez? That is not what the FBI and the Department of Justice is supposed to be doing. And they were not supposed to be leaking to the press during the early stages of their investigation, which violated my rights to a fair process. I've made my share of mistakes. But my mistakes were never a crime. I've learned through this process a lot about our system of justice. It is truly a system of justice you can afford. I understand why so many Americans feel that justice is elusive. But for supporters from across the country who believed in me, who knew who I am and what I stand for, I could never have afforded the millions of dollars this case has cost. So my gratitude to all those New Jerseyans and Americans from across the country who believed in me and helped me mount my legal defense against the millions of dollars spent by the overwhelming weight of the federal government. I've also learned about the incredible weight and power of the federal government and how it can crush you if it wants to. It gives me an even greater resolve to make sure that there is a check to that awesome power. Because where do I go to? What office or department of the federal government gives me back the past two and a half years of my life? Where do I go to to have the damage <clears throat> they sought to incur to my reputation? Where, where is it? What department is it that replaces it? So let me share some final thoughts. To those who left me, who abandoned me in my darkest moment, I forgive you. To those who embraced me in my darkest moment, I love you. To those New Jerseyans who gave me the benefit of the doubt, I thank you. To those who have a doubt, I'm gonna work harder than ever before so that there is no doubt. To those in the press 
who did their job and did it with professionalism, and even to some of you who are actually kind. Where's Dominic? I don't see him. Dominic? I believe you showed others what a professional press is all about and why that freedom is so important to our society. To those who were digging my political grave so that they could jump into my seat, I know who you are, and I won't forget you. <laughs> Finally, let me answer the question that I could not answer before the trial was over. Why didn't I testify? There is nothing more that I wanted to do but to tell my story. I am proud of the thousands of people I've helped in New Jersey and across the country who I have helped with their visas, reuniting families, and very often bringing people who were denied so that they could save the life of a loved one. I'm proud of my work to have 100% port scanning, something I have been a champion of and believe is in the vital national security interests of the United States to secure it and to stop the flow of drugs. My fight to save Medicare hundreds of millions of dollars. I believe we can't afford to throw out good medicine when we can carefully administer it to patients. But a trial is not a debate. It's not a public forum. It's a legal proceeding. My testimony on direct and cross-examination would have likely taken days. That means we would have put at risk losing one of the jurors who was told she would be excused to go on a pre-planned vacation. And we collectively felt by the way she reacted to different parts of the prosecution and defense's uh, presentations that she believed in our innocence. And we didn't want to lose her. And boy, were we right on that. We still lost her. Secondly, the prosecution would have used me to redo their entire meritless case in chief all over again, including having me read emails and other materials that were not mine, but would have put my voice and my name for their purpose, in essence, giving them an additional summation before their final summation. So that was just a small window into my thinking. Anyone who knows me knows that I never seek a fight, but they also know that I never shy away from one. This wasn't a fair fight. I've spent 43 years, my entire adult life, in public service to the people of New Jersey and the nation. It has been one of my greatest privileges. I have served with honesty and integrity and given it my all every day. I am proud of what I have been able to accomplish for the people of New Jersey. I'm proud that many young people and many from the Hispanic community look at me and say it's possible to grow up poor, live in a tenement, go to public schools, be the first in your family to go to college, and rise to be one of 100 United States senators in a country of 310 million people. I look forward to going back to Washington to fight for the people of New Jersey and many across the country to help them realize their hopes, their dreams, their aspirations. Today is Resurrection Day, and I want to thank God once again for allowing me to stand before you as I walked into this courthouse 11 weeks ago, an innocent man. Let me just say a few words in Spanish. Quiero darle gracias a Dios por, porque es por su poder. All right, guys, so an emotional Bob Menendez there. His trial ends in a hung jury, and he's a powerful Democrat senator, Democratic senator in New Jersey. Um, this was actually the first bribery trial for a sitting U.S. senator in decades, so pretty big deal. And this um, was uh, him speaking here to the press, pretty emotional, talking about his family, the jury themselves, the people that supported him throughout it, and that's how it all ends. But I don't want to take away, too, from some of the other topics that we've been talking about, guys, too. Um, including sexual harassment and assault and on the on the Hill in Congress in Hollywood. I see that a lot of you guys are chatting about it. I was just talking with our sports reporter Brody Logan and he was saying people are going to come out now and and they're just people are just pulling strings. People are coming out slowly and it makes people think back and and get worried. And some of you were saying this on the stream, you know, what has happened in my past? You know, what should should we be wary of? And um, and it's true. It's a, definitely a serious thing. And it's a big deal that's coming out. And uh, one of you said that someone else is coming out about Al Franken. I didn't quite see that, but if we do catch it, 
Maybe we'll talk about it tomorrow on the stream as well. Um, and I'm sure definitely we'll have that ongoing story as it's developing come out in our evening broadcast tonight and later into the evening as well. Um, wanted to quickly mention, Kathy, you were talking about the, the Air and Space Museum here in DC. It's one of the best, people love it. It's actually the second most visited in the world by statistics, which is actually really interesting by the numbers. I think the first is the Louvre in Paris, um, but it's great that your son loves to go to that one. So thanks for that comment, guys, and thanks so much for being awesome, loyal viewers, guys. You guys are really keeping up the chat and the stream interesting, and uh, thanks for liking how we kind of switched it around. I know we have varied things today. Here's a live look at the, the floor uh, in the house, talking about tax reform as they're voting today, and we kind of mixed it up with, their, with that. Um, I also wanted to mention, and we didn't get to this, but um, today, the Department of Homeland Security announced the arrests of 200, more than 200, MS-13 gang members. It's um, a, an issue they've been, they've been talking about and fighting for a long time, and it was an operation called Raging Bull. So our Tom Fitzgerald Fitz will have more on that story tonight at 5, um, and we can look for that article too, and we'll report more on that tomorrow as we find out more. Um, but with that, guys, I want to thank you so much for joining on the stream and for chatting about all the various topics that we've talked about. We've kind of kept it really varied and interesting, and I'm glad that you guys like that style. So don't forget to follow us at Fox5DC. We're, of course, Fox5DC.com, and then all of our platforms, guys, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, we're all over everything, and then here on the YouTube stream. And if you're not a subscriber but you're joining us today, click the red button that says subscribe for more videos, and you'll get an alert as to when we come up tomorrow. So join us again at 11, guys. We'll have... Mike Thomas doing a little weather, talking about uh, what it's going to be like for Thanksgiving. Um, I was hearing snow today, but now I don't think that's the case. Mike said it's not Stations true. Assume, no snow on Florida, Thanksgiving. Of Congress, um, but today. yeah, Pete, Congress. Kathy, Schultz, thanks for sticking out to the end. So We're going to bring you to a shot of the White House, which is looking gorgeous today in the autumn. And we're gonna enjoy a little Thanksgiving dinner in the newsroom. So I'll let you know how that goes too. And don't forget our very cool digital installation display coverage of this really cool surprise um, installation that I'm covering today for social media. So check that out tomorrow. All right guys, we'll take care. See you tomorrow.